For any reason you'd like a copy of this nonsense, you send six ninety five to box nine sixty two, Washington DC, Lion Recording. Tell them when you heard the show and they'll be very happy to provide it for you. If you want the zip code, look it up in your telephone book. Hmm. Two double oh four four. Uh, Chantilly, Virginia. Hello there. Yeah, hi, Bruce. Hello there, baby. What's um, up? Um, I'm a little nervous. I'm no. a first time caller, so I'm very nervous. I will be very gentle. But I listen to you every day, well, and I you. thought it's time to call. Well, I'm very happy you're here. What's on your mind? Well, we have the problem, the following problem. I'll try to make it sweet and short. Short and sweet or sweet and short? <laughs> Whichever way. <laughs> Um, about two weeks ago, my son went to school. It's a public college in our vehicle. And on the way, leaving the parking lot, going onto the road in the parking lot, uh, there was a car parked on the side of the road, and he stopped and then went by it, and the gentleman pulled into the rear tire of his vehicle, our vehicle. Uh, what, the right rear? Uh, right, the passenger side rear. Mm-hmm. Pulled his front left fender hit our car tire. Mm -hmm. uh, my son got out, pulled, a, you know, finished pulling around, and they pulled out, exchanged names. The police wouldn't come because it's a public lot, private lot, private lot. Right. I'm sorry. And um, the gentleman, you know, was a foreigner, spoke very broken English, and told my son, you know, he doesn't know what to do, but he'll get back with him. My son comes home, calls me at work. I report the accident to the insurance, and we didn't hear anything for a few days. Well, wait a while. Did you did you try to contact the other guy? No, no. Um, I guess why? Because they exchanged insurance information at the time. What does that guy do then? Well, we're new at this, so I'm not sure. You know, this is what they tell us to do in their brochures and whatever. I'm not sure that's what they tell you, but go ahead. Well, they have this little kit they give us, and in there it says, contact the insurance, do this, exchange information. Yeah, well, I understand that, but then you go back to the other guy and you talk to him. Oh, well, <laughs> you didn't we, did, we didn't, because this, like I said, was okay, okay. never okay. happened before. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway, so uh, I called the insurance, reported it. A few days later, I uh, oh, it turned out there was a, wit the, 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 a witness who pulled into my son's parking spot, mm -hmm. was walking to class and saw the whole thing happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman claimed with our insurance that my son was driving. I mean, he was driving and my son passed him, whereas my son and the other witness said that the guy was parked on the side of the road mm -hmm. and, you know, was leaning over the passenger seat doing something and my son stopped and went around him. Mm -hmm. So our insurance found both parties at fault and therefore is not paying anything out. That's called contributory negligence. Right, which I was fighting at the time because mm -hmm. from what I understand calling the police, the other gentleman was pulling into traffic, so he would have been in fault. Well, but the, 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 well the, I don't want to go into the theory of contributory uh -huh. negligence, but it's, it's weird. But go ahead. Okay, so anyway, so now a few... A week later, we have a warrant at our door. A warrant? Uh, well, it's called a or, warrant. Or is it called a summons? <laughs> well, it's called a warrant in debt. I mean, this guy is suing. And he's suing us for the maximum and small claims court in Virginia, $4,000. Yeah. Our vehicle, I filed a claim with his insurance, but our vehicle doesn't have any damage. So to speak. Well, so, if you if you have no damage, right. then you have nothing to worry about. But I notified his insurance is basically what I did. All right, and, they, and you notify your insurance company you're being sued. Right, and I they, understand. And they will defend you. That's why I'm a little confused. Well, don't be confused. That's what liability insurance is all about. Because they said now I have to send them the warrant, the summons. Yes, because they have to defend you. Their lawyer will come to court, yep. and I'm not quite sure what is going on. Well, they're going to defend you. You have, you pay an insurance premium, right? Uh -huh. You pay for two things. You pay for if you get in a situation where you are judged to be liable, they got to pay up to the limits of the policy. Uh -huh. They also have to provide you with an adequate defense, which frequently can be more expensive than the, the judgment. Uh -huh. Well, that's what they're doing. They're saying send over the paperwork and we'll take care of it. Uh -huh. Well, today I have a notice from the post office saying there's a certified letter. From well, go pick it up. Pardon? Go get it. Uh-huh. Okay. And not worry about it? What's to worry about? 
Well, I was just curious because they found both parties at fault. No, they didn't find anybody at well, fault. Well, a contributory. They or... didn't find anybody at fault or contributory. That was their their position. Mm -hmm. So does that mean they come what? to court and they say, well... No, no, hold on, take a deep breath. Okay, I'm trying. Your company denied denied any liability to the other guy. Correct. He, in turn, is suing you. Correct. Which is perfectly normal. Correct. Your company's going to defend you. Uh -huh. The fact that they denied it doesn't mean that you don't have liability. It just means they say that they don't want to have liability. Okay. If a court of proper jurisdiction says it disagrees, then they're going to pay. Uh -huh. Perfectly routine. Don't sweat it. Oh, it is? Yes, ma'am. So I don't call a lawyer? Or... No, ma'am. You got a lawyer. Okay. And who's going to be on our side? Well... That's why I'm a little concerned. I hope so. Yes, that's why you pay for insurance. Uh huh. There's nothing to worry about. Okay. Go out and have a couple of fingers of black label and then have a nice evening. Now, what happens if they find us guilty? They're going to pay. They're going to pay. Your insurance company is going to pay. Uh huh. Okay. Okay, because a thousand dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> I thought it was four thousand. No, one thousand is the maximum in Virginia you can uh, file for. Virginia's backward, like a couple of other states. A thousand dollars doesn't mean today. But anyway, nothing to worry about. Okay. That's your insurance company's going to defend you okay. or, or pay one or the other. Okay. I wish okay. you well, dear. I certainly appreciate. Hang it. Hang in there, as I said. Have a little couple of fingers of good scotch. Maybe it's what you need tonight. Rochester, New York, W-H-A-M. Hello. Yes. I uh, just want to tell you, I'm reading your book right now. It's really good. It's got a lot of good practical uh, information for small business. Thank business you people. very much. And my question is involving small business here. All right. And basically, we have it's a three-person company. And we hired an office manager through a temporary, temporary agency uh, about three months ago. And the contract has expired. All right. So we're going to hire her, okay. and I'm going to be talking with her tomorrow morning. And she's worked out well. And I just was trying to find out you know, if you had any suggestions on you know how I should approach this. Well, let's do a pro. First, you got a couple of things to consider. Sure. One, the likelihood is that you owe the temporary agency a fee if you hire her. Oh, we've already paid that fee. The fee's already been paid, and the whole contract's ended. So you, now we'll, be, well, wait a minute. You, wait, 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 are you sure about that? Yeah, we've paid the we've paid a number of what two or three dollars over her salary. Yeah, uh, but that that no 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 no. You're missing something, Tiger. Okay. In most temporary agreements, if you hire the person yourself on a permanent basis, you got to exactly. pay them. You got to pay them a fee, probably fifteen hundred, two thousand hmm. dollars. Well, that they've already told me that uh, this contract is done. It's not as far as the temporary employment is concerned. Sure. But generally, if you hire a temp, you then have to pay a regular employment agency fee. No, we're not hiring. We're hiring her for our company. Oh. We're not going to hire her through that agency anymore. That's what I'm trying to oh, okay. explain to you. That if you hire her, you, well, I'll put it another way. You were introduced to her by the temp agency. Exactly. You paid them... Uh, uh, an override on her salary. That's exactly. that, but that is a separate issue. Now that you are offering her a job, check your paperwork. You may owe them as much as a couple of grand. Huh. I thought I checked that out before. I even well, went and out. you may be right, but I looked that one over very thoroughly because that would be customary. Okay. Now, well, other than that, you're just hiring somebody. You'll be, you know what you're going to pay her? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Should I pay her on an hourly basis or on a salary basis? Well, I, that's entirely up to you. I, I think mean. a salary is more professional. I think it's something that's, uh, that would... Well, it also means you have some responsibilities. On the other hand, if she's out for a half a day or a day, you got to pay her if she's on a salary basis. Exactly. If, she's on, if she's on an hourly basis, you do not. Okay, exactly. All right. But on an hourly basis, you got to pay her overtime. On a, salary ba on a salary basis, under most conditions, you do not. Mm -hmm. But on balance, I'm more comfortable with a salary, but that's just me in a, in a position of this kind. And I guess in benefits, what sorts of benefits? That's I should... up to you. Yeah. Is it a corporation? Yes. What benefits do you give yourself? Health insurance. you got to give her the same thing after, a, after whatever waiting period it seems reasonable. Okay. You can't discriminate. How often should I do a uh, evaluation? 
review. Maybe review. One, I think once a year is, is once sufficient. A year. Yeah, but you're a one man band over there. I mean, it's not it's not as if you're not going to see this lady pretty regularly. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, one Every thing. Day, if you, yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, if you one thing, if you hired her, well, listen now. When we're having a, a big reunion in the year 2000, I hope we get together. Yeah, yeah. This is not the. So you know what she's doing, and, and she will know whether whether you're she's in your good graces or not. I would hope so if you're candid. Sure. So I mean, the, yes, you ought to have some kind of a, a, an informal review, but I don't think it's quite the same as when you have a ton of employees. Sure. But the but the one thing that you must be sensitive to is that uh, any benefits the corporation pays you guys. After whatever waiting period you have prescribed in your minutes, which have to be reasonably, you're going to give them to her, too. Okay. Good luck, guy. I'm Bruce Williams. Temple Hills, Maryland. Guess who's on deck? Hello, man. Hello there. Uh, about two years ago, I installed a pressure-treated fence uh, on one side of my yard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had new neighbors moved in. And they uh, took a two-by-four pressure-treated and uh, nailed it into the ground and didn't leave enough space in between the pressure treated um, piece of no, I'm losing it here. Uh, they didn't leave any space between the, the pressure treated log that they, they nailed into the ground. And they installed a vegetable garden about one third the length of my fence. On their property? On their property. But they put a, a law, like a tie, a tie or something up against your fence. Uh, a, a piece of wood, pressure treated wood. Yeah. But they didn't leave me enough space to what? walk around on that side to. Uh, to what? To spray the fence, maybe. Well, wait a while. How far back from the from the property line did you put the fence? Uh, I'm not too sure, but I did leave enough space to walk. Well, I mean, how much? I mean, six inches, a foot, two foot. I think at least. Uh, I would say six to twelve inches. Well, you can't walk on six inches, honey. Not unless you're, you know, you can, you can, you couldn't do it. Your, your I'm shoulders. Not too, I'm not too sure, but I thought I left enough space to well, walk. The chances are you probably did. Huh? The chances are you probably did not. Uh huh. Um, I oh, guess. Have you talked to them about this? Uh, no, I just. Want well, to figure out the best way to try to handle it. I mean, well, you just want to go, well, stay, stand by now. Every once in a while, maybe once a year, you want to go over there and spray your fence, right? Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you just say to them, I'd like to come over here once a year and spray the fence and do it when the things aren't growing. Okay. and um, Do it in the early spring or late fall. Okay, but I also feel that their garden will cause my uh, wood to rot. No, I don't think so. You don't think I mean, so? It doesn't matter. They have a right to do on their property what they want to do. Okay. So I guess now I have to ask for permission to go over there. Well, I wouldn't. Yeah, I would just see. Don't you get along with these people? Yes. Well, you say, look, every year I, I like to take care of my fence, and it's it's to their advantage to have that side of the fence in good shape. And I just want I'm gonna let you know that every year it's been my custom to go down and spray the thing, and I'll do it after your garden has been plucked and scattered in the fall. Okay. I don't think it's a big deal. Okay. Good luck, sweetheart. Thank you. North Reading, PA. Hello. 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 I thought you were out to lunch. Hello did you there. Say, did you say North Reading? I let me see. Let me try again. My North Reading, Pennsylvania. No, Hello, Massachusetts. Maybe that's why I didn't get it. <laughs> All right, North okay. Reading, Ohio. What's on your mind? No, North Reading, Massachusetts, and I'm a little bit nervous. You're in Ohio. You just don't know where you are. That's no, all. I'm, I'm Massachusetts, and I know it. <laughs> What's on your okay, mind? Okay, I have a TV problem. A TV I problem. I paid a lot of money back in April of 1990. I paid $2,000 for a television set. Oh. And I, they talked me into buying this insurance policy because these things are so, so terribly expensive to repair. The service policy. Yeah. yeah. So I bought this policy, and the TV quit this year in April, which is four years, and this policy was for five years. So we call them up and find out that the company's out of business. Then you're out of business. I have no, the, the company that sold it to me isn't going to help me out at all. I got it. Oh, well, they sell you, did they sell you a, a, a policy with a with a uh, independent company? Yes. Yeah, you're you're stuck. Yeah, I'm stuck. Now, I I would certainly make an overture to the people that sold it to you. Yeah. But that's why you keep hearing me say that I don't like to buy service policies under most conditions, and there are some exceptions, uh -huh. unless they're issued by the manufacturer. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because the smaller guys have a propensity for doing the belly up scene. Uh huh. Okay. So the, the, the service the company is gone, huh? Right. Gone. Eighty six. And you know, and we paid two thousand dollars for the set and now, it's gonna... what, what'd you pay for the service policy? Um it, it, it isn't on here. That's why I was wondering if maybe the company would do something because it all it says is it lists the T V, the you know, it gives you the the full price we pay. Then under yeah. it is listed as something or other T V yeah. and then the warranty, the name of the company and then delivery and it's all underneath one price. It isn't itemized. Hmm. I thought, well, maybe the company who sold it to me. Well, what do you have to lose by asking? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Nothing. Nothing. We'll do that. I wish you well, dear. Thanks very much. Hang in there. If you're, you're sure you're in Massachusetts. I think it says Ohio here. I'm sure I am. No, uh, you look like an Ohio to me. <laughs> Bruce Williams. <laughs> She's confused. This is talk. Man. No, I don't go shopping, grocery shopping, uh, any more than I absolutely have to. Just, you know, some, <laughs> I don't do it very well, and fortunately, I have to do it very often. But when I'm moving from, from one domicile to another, as I have to do for business reasons, you know, I, I you know, clean up the fridge when I leave one place, and so I gotta pick up some new stuff, as I did today. Well, right coming from the airport, I stopped at the cleaners, got the stuff I dropped off before I left, and then this last trip, and so on and so forth, and I go to the grocery store. Now, everybody has a blind, not everyone, but I have a blind spot, and that is the price of soft drinks. I really am sensitive to that. Other things, I haven't a clue what they cost, but I know how much a six-pack, a case, whatever should cost. So I walk in, and there is a, isn't it amazing that Coke and Pepsi almost always cost exactly the same? What a coincidence, huh? But anyway, there's there's a 12-pack up there, and it's the today's special on the end, you know, the end uh, of the of the... The aisle, that's the heavy duty stuff. Four ninety nine for a twelve pack. Well, that seemed a little expensive to me, uh, against uh, where I've just come from. But okay, so I go back and look in the aisle. Up oh, same price, so I take my twelve cans and put it into the cart. I did the rest of the stuff. You know, I'm in there buying all this fat free stuff. Oh, is it awful? You got to start thinking that way. But that's another question. Oh, well, just before the end of my excursion, way down in the corner. Here is a whole pyramid of six packs, and they're two bucks a piece, a buck ninety-nine. Well, let me see: six and six is twelve. Dollar ninety-nine is three ninety-eight. That's a dollar one cent less than the the twelve pack. Whoa! Can't understand this, but what the hell? Take the twelve pack out, put the twelve pack over here. Take two six packs. I just made a buck. I get to the checkout line, and I. Uh, Said to the lady, I got a question for you. I, I don't know if you have a, an answer for me, but how come it cost four dollars and ninety nine cents? There's a big sign up there, giant special. But if I buy two six packs, it's only three dollars and ninety eight cents. She says, "Oh well, you, you have to read the circular." Well, why do I have to do that? Because you get two six packs for four ninety nine. Well, there's a sign up there. It's got to be ten foot wide. Doesn't say. Doesn't say. Well, it doesn't have to say that. Uh, you're supposed to read the circle. <laughs> See, you get two packs, two six packs. So I take my two or two twelve. I take my two little six packs out, pile them on top of something, and go over and grab two twelves. You women have a tough problem with this shopping. How are you supposed to know? You have the Ouija board to let you know that the prices have changed. I walked out of there talking to myself, but I walked out with a case for four ninety nine. So life is not all that bad. I just I have a real blind spot when it comes to. The price of soft drinks. I, I always feel I'm overpaying, and I think I'm probably right most of the time. All righty. Where are we going, Danny? Midland, Virginia. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. Hello. I have listened to you for so many years, and I have never had an occasion to really have to call you, but now I do. Well, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're there. Um, we have a little mom-and-pop store, and I mean a little mom-and-pop store, and we had gas gasoline here. Not in the front gasoline and groceries inside? Exactly. And uh, beer and Pepsi's and all the good stuff. But uh, we have a problem now. We're on the brink of bankruptcy for the last three years. What's now? now? Well, it seems now, uh, when we thought we could, since the economy has picked up and everything, it seems now that we've sprung a leak. I'm sorry? Pardon? You sprung a leak? In our storage tank underground oh my goodness gracious that is a huge problem i know it is do you but have insurance i hope we do not but the gas 
the, the uh, who, tank, owns, who owns the tank that's underground? That's exactly what I was going to tell you. The gas company owns the tanks and the pumps. Oh. And we need to know who is liable. They would be. They would be? But they're going to, they, let's face it, they're going to go after the, the, the uh, environmental agencies are going to go after the guy with the deepest pockets, and that sure isn't you. No, it definitely isn't. But you gotta, how, how bad is the pollution? Well, I don't know. Um, how old are the tanks? I have no idea. We've been here for almost 12 years. And they're, they were there when you got they there? They were there, yes. Metal tanks, right? Yes. I'm surprised. That, is it a major gasoline company? Um, yes. I'm surprised they haven't yanked that and put a fiberglass tank in. Well, I think the thing is that we're facing like a twenty thousand dollar a year insurance thing for for them to. Um, we don't sell that much gas. It's, like I said, it's a small place. Yeah, but who owns the tank in the ground? Can you cut me off? I'll tell you. No, I mean, I mean, you tell me it's an oil company, right? Yes. In that case, are they aware of the leak? Yes. And is anybody else aware of the leak? I think the whole county is aware of it. At this point. I'm sorry. The whole county is aware of it at this point. What are they doing about it? Nothing. They tell us, uh, oh, just don't worry about it. You just, we just won't give you any more gas. you got to be kidding me. No, I'm not. I'd see an attorney in a rush. You, wanna fi you own the property, right? We own the property. I understand. But you want to fix that liability in a hurry. Exactly. And they, you know, they're liable to, they, they, first of all, there's no statute of limitations on, on uh, pollution. Uh, in my opinion, unhappily, but that's another matter. Well, um, what should we do with these people? I mean, this is, this is the first stages of this thing. The first thing to do is see your attorney. Have your attorney contact the, and I wouldn't do it myself, the, huh? the, the gasoline company, the oil company, and explain that there is a leak, that this tank well, is their property, and that you would like them to, to remove it and uh do whatever cleanup is necessary to satisfy the, the appropriate environmental agencies. Exactly. They have to remove the dirt and everything, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. But the big thing is that you want to fix that responsibility. Oh, get on. And I'm taking, your, I'm taking your word that you know what you're talking about when you say they own the tank. Oh, I know they do. How do you know that? Yeah, well, because we tried to change um, oil companies at one point. Yeah. And they came out and looked at the at the thing, and they said they didn't want to buy anybody else's problem. <laughs> so, well, wait a minute. What, what does that mean? Well, the, they they actually do own the tank. No, wait a minute. That, that, what you just told me doesn't prove anything. Oh. What you told me was that they didn't want the, the, the new oil company didn't want to, did not want to use that tank, but that didn't fix ownership for the other oh. gas company. Okay. I want to know who. Maybe you own that tank. Well, from. Well, like I said, we've been here for 12 years. Has, when, when you bought the... Well, yeah, well, they told us that the oil company owned them. But you have nothing to prove that. How did I find that out? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, a minute ago, you told me that you knew what you were talking about. And now you're not so sure. <laughs> I know. Um, but I was taking the word of the previous owner. Well, is he, he or she still around? Yes. Well, you may want to go talk to them in a hurry. Because okay. guess what? They're in the loop, too. Are you kidding? Yes, ma'am. Oh dear. All right. So the first thing I should do is what? I'd go talk to the previous owner and say when we, maybe they know when the tank was put in uh -huh. and by whom. Uh huh. Uh, you don't want to start stirring up uh, the county and looking for permits just yet. Yeah, I do not. You do not. Okay. Then you want to talk to your attorney when you and and see what course he or she wishes to pursue. But don't sit on this kid because you can take every nickel you got. All right, then we should do everything according to Hoyle. No, I, I never said that. I said I would do it according to the way I just described. Uh huh. That may not be according to Hoyle. Okay. We won't, we won't get into that. All right. I do wish you well, dear. Thank you very much. Cincinnati, Ohio. Hello. Hi, Bruce. Hi. Um, we um, are looking into the possibility of being log home dealers. All right. And um, we have four girls that we'd like to send to private school and my husband's work at the ministry is just not going to do that. And Your husband's always, work at what, dear? His, his work at the ministry is just not going to supply our four what children kind of through yeah. private school. Uh -huh. So um, we are uh, total novices to the business world. We've never, um, I have some past radio sales experience, but he's the um, 
He's a brawn man, and he does a lot of uh, fix-it type of work. Well, how did you? I mean, how did you come upon this type of uh, an enterprise? Okay, we heard an ad over the radio. Um, well, I, we had looked into several different uh, companies um, that sell log homes. We well, how did no way but back up? Okay. How did you decide on log homes? Well, basically, we always wanted a log home. We want to build a log home for ourselves, mm -hmm. and we want to make that log home work for us if we can, but, as a model. Yeah, but that isn't my question. Okay. I understand what you said, and maybe that ties together. I just want to know how you happen to say, did you wake up one morning and say, I want to be a log home dealer? Well, it, it was um, when we sent for the information on their particular deal. Oh, in other words, you were, you were responding to an ad. Basically, yes. Yeah. Not basically. You responded to an ad, period. Yes. All right. And the ad was to sell a log home or to become a dealer for a um, log home? Both. Well, in that case, that's what, that was what caused you to think about this. It yes. was the advertisement. Exactly. Well, that's, you see, it's different than, than saying, by gosh, all my life I wanted to be a log home dealer. No, no, that's Nothing not. Nothing of the kind. That's not an aspiration uh, of ours, I don't think, long term. Uh, right. I'm not so sure it should be a short term aspiration. Oh, is that true? Well, we were going, wondering if we had just bought into a sales ploy. I think, yeah, you know nothing about a very complex enterprise. Okay, well, we were going to go down to North Carolina to check out the operation. Well, you can do that. Why don't you get a job? Um, well, I am a stay-at-home mom for four children. and Well, maybe you can't afford to be a stay-at-home mom anymore if you want to send the four kids to, to private school. I mean, there's some... I used to be in the private school business. Uh-huh. And I can tell you, a lot of mothers went out to work to support that habit. Right. I mean, a lot of a lot of people just cannot afford the luxury of, A, being a stay-at-home mom and going to private school. Right. And particularly on a pastor's salary. Yeah, that's true. Or you may have to make some, some changes in your either either your aspiration for the kids in private school. Yes. Or alternatively, your aspiration to be the stay-at-home mom. Yes. Well, that's true. I mean, you, um, you, you, you got to there's some give-ups along the way here, sweetheart. Yes, there is. There's. Uh, I'm finding that out as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, so when these people want us to lay on the line four thousand dollars on our first trip down there, you would highly I suggest would, against I that. I would not take my credit cards, and I'd leave my pen home, and certainly my money home. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I you got to realize that you got to know something about zoning and building codes and a whole uh, lot of other we stuff. We found a lot that we want to build it on. Um, it has no stipulations on the co on the you know on what kind of home can be built there. Well, I mean, is this what you're going, this, you're going to turn this into the parsonage? Uh, no, it's not necessarily a parsonage. What's it going to, are you going to live there? Yes, we're going to live there. <clears throat> Currently, they, does your, your congregation provide you with a place to live? No, no, no. My husband works for a housing ministry. He's a, not necessarily a pastor. He is a plumber, carpenter, electrician, fix-it man for a, a ministry. It's a housing ministry in over the Rhine. Yeah. And um, he does a lot of good work there. I'm sure, but I, I, I must turn you loose. But if I were you, I'd walk very softly. You're talking about a, a business which requires business acumen right. and experience, none of which you're bringing to this mix. Okay. I well, I have I'd, had some prior sales experience. Yeah, I, you mentioned that. You sold radio time. You might want to go back to doing that again. Mm. Yeah. Then, mate, you, you, when you work on a commission, it wouldn't pay the babysitter. That's not true. If you're good at what you do, there's some of the highest paid people around. You think? I know. I, think well, I work for Christian Station. I know. Well, that maybe is something you can't afford. That's a luxury you might not afford either. Yes. I do wish you well, dear. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Bed. La Crosse, Wisconsin. Hello there. Hello. How are you doing tonight, Bruce? Good. What's on your mind? Well, I uh, I got a question here for you. It's about an employer. Um, we work in a printing industry, and a job was ran, and there were some things that were wrong with the job, and now the... Uh, a client is complaining, right. and the and the owner of the business is talking about charging the pressman for the time and labor. I don't see how you can do that. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Uh, it, but even if the pressman made the mistakes, let's okay. make the, the assumption that they did. That's part of being in business. Right. Uh, now, they, they, now, they can fire them right. for being incompetent. Nothing wrong with that. Right. I'm not going to tell you it's the most compassionate thing to right. do, <laughs> but uh, the best of my knowledge in most, if not all the states, you can't charge an employee back for, for making a mistake. The employee steals, that's a little different matter. Well, yeah. Well, I worked, like I worked for a, for a bus company and, and we had a bonus program and if we had an accident or something like that, then they took bonus away from us. Well, that's a different matter because right. a bonus is not a right, it's, it's a privilege. Okay. 
And okay. I, don't have any I don't have any quarrel with that. Sure, I didn't either. And that may be a, a real good way, good incentive to keep you from having accidents. Right, <laughs> right. But, uh, in this instance, how, how much money is involved? Um, I'm not sure what the final bill is, actually. It's, it's probably a couple thousand dollars to the client, though. Well, that's absurd. I mean, I, it's unfortunate. Right. And uh, loss prevention is something that your, your, your employer certainly has every right to be concerned with. And you want to go, you know, hopefully that everybody involved will learn from the experience. And I don't, uh, I can understand when a guy may go in and chew a little butt. <laughs> but as far as getting into your paycheck, I have to believe that that is completely improper. Great. Thanks, I, Bruce. I do wish you all my friend. Right. Yeah, part of being the boss is eating mistakes. And let me tell you something, uh, lots of ketchup helps. So I know it's not easy. That's a given, okay? But then why should it be? But try and do it right, huh? What's up, baby? Yeah, well, now I have a little problem that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I also have some allergies, if you'll notice, uh, and I apologize for that. Uh, but I have a little problem with a re recording of a mortgage on a deed. Re recording? Right. Why does it have to be, re why does it have to be recorded more than once? Well, um, Oh, let's see, in 1992, we took out a mortgage on the home. And uh, <clears throat> so we have a back property also, but it's not on the same deed. So somehow in the it's a, it's, a, it's a separate property altogether. Right. They're on two separate deeds. That's cool. Right. So somehow the um, attorney for the um, mortgage company got into the possession of the wrong deed. Huh. Now, since I had a broker, I don't know how that happened, uh, which we shouldn't, you know, gone through a broker, but we did. Why not? Uh, well, it would have saved us money, and it wouldn't have, uh, yeah, nevertheless. Um, I, you know, I Don't misunderstand me. They have to make a living, too. Uh, but anyway, the mortgage company's lawyer, attorney, got a hold of the wrong deed and recorded the mortgage on that deed. On the wrong property. On the, yeah, on the wrong property. Right. Okay. Uh, about a year later, when my husband and I were going over the things, we uh, discovered that the mortgage was on the wrong property, which the, the other property that the mortgage uh, had been put on is really not of the, uh, you know, the value. Yeah, well, that, that, that shouldn't be too hard to straighten out. Huh? Well, I thought not. But it's turned out to be such a hassle. What's the hassle? Well, the, you know, we notified the company, uh, the, the attorney, that they had the wrong deed and mortgage on the deed. Uh, it should have been, as you said, a very simple thing to settle. Now, let me, I, all I wanted back, once we signed a new mortgage to cover, you know, the property they thought they were covering, all I wanted back was the original mortgage marked satisfied. For some reason, they don't want to do it that way. How do they want? Well, let me tell you. First, he sends me papers with the original, a copy of the original mortgage, with the X out description and a Schedule A in place of it with the proper description. Okay, the courthouse says no. We will not. Rec well, we initial that. The courthouse would not record that. Mm. Second time. We went down and signed another copy of the original mortgage, which some time later, I had to, their manager said that we would get the mortgage back, the original stamp satisfied. Mm -hmm. We went down and signed it. Anyway, six or eight weeks later, after we called them again, we were notified that they had lost that mortgage somewhere between uh, the two offices, who, which were in two different cities. Mm -hmm. And so, now, recently, the attorney has sent me another copy of the original mortgage, and they're always calling these originals, but they're really copies. Well, it doesn't think it matters a whole lot, but go ahead. Pardon? I don't think it matters, but go ahead. Well, uh, apparently the courthouse in Greenville won't record a copy. Well, here, here let's, get, let's cut through this a little bit, okay? Okay. There, there are th I, I, and I sound like a broken record, and you're going to have to forgive me, or at least try to forgive me. All right. But there are things that you shouldn't be doing yourself, and this is one of them. Okay. Give it to an attorney to handle. Well, okay, I'll agree with you. But it's kind of difficult to get an attorney to take a case against 
I mean, just it's to not be, against. Well, anybody. I know just to straighten out something no, with another it's, attorney. No, it's not. It certainly is not. Well, it's been my experience recently. Well, maybe how many attorneys did you approach? All uh, three. And all three said no. Well. No, either they said yes or they said no. Well, they really didn't want to bother with it. Well, you know, because they maybe. Well, I'd advise you to do so and so. And. Well, well, wait, wait, wait. What, what, very quickly, I only got a minute or two. Okay. What did they advise you to do? Okay, one said, to give you a quick quote, one said, I advise you to tell the uh, attorney, the mortgage company, that when you give them a set, when they give you a satisfied uh, deed for the first mortgage, then you'll sign the other one. I mean, you, you know, that's no real. No, yeah, that's, that's not a bad you, you don't want to sell anything right now, do you? No. That's not a bad answer. You guys straighten it out, or it's too bad. You got less of a, you have less collateral now than you had than you should have. That's not a bad answer at all. Oh well, yeah, okay. You say when you straighten it out, call me. Not not one day earlier. Okay. In other words, am I entitled to ask for the original? Back? I, I, I don't think that's an issue right now. What difference does it make? They are sitting with less collateral than right. they should have. Right. They're losers, not you. Right. I just wanted to do the honest right well, thing. Well, the honest thing. You just say, to the, I, I, I like that guy's advice. Yeah. If you write them one letter and say, this is the problem, you created it, when you solve it, I'll be willing to, I will not sign any documents until the entire thing is solved in one shot. Okay. But, uh, you know, do I have a right to ask for the deed back? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But I don't understand why you're getting all hyper. I'm all hyper. Yes, you are. Because you, right now, you are in a better position than you would have been ordinarily. Right. I you, you've got that. one property free and clear that's worth more. Then they granted the mortgage for. Right. You could sell it. Right. And they'd be in tough. I, I, I don't think you're, you're worried about something. I would just tell them, you straighten it out. I won't sign anything until the entire matter is straightened out. To the satisfaction of my attorney, who you will have to pay. Yeah. Oh, they will have to pay. I would tell them that. I won't sign anything. Okay. Fine. I wish you well, dear. I'm Bruce Wiggins. I'm here. For talk now. Winthrop, Massachusetts. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. I have a question about my health insurance payment. I'm yes, unemployed and paying off my company, on the company, under COBRA. It turns now, out that they, what that means. well, COBRA, I, I can continue the life insurance coverage, I mean the health insurance coverage for a year and a half. For 18 months. Right. right. I mean, you leave a, I mean, a lot of people may not know that. That's the reason I'm Oh, I see. It's just for other folks, not for you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the point is, they're not turning in the money to the insurance company. They're not. No, and so I got a letter from the insurance company saying that the company did not uh, pay after the 1st of January, and unfortunately, they could not continue the coverage, but they would be glad to keep me on as a private patient, a private patient. Do you, do you, have, a, uh, do you have receipts? Oh, yeah, I've got to cancel checks. All right. Have you confronted the company with it? Well, I did, and they said that they were trying to work out an arrangement with yeah. the insurance company. What they, the arrangement is that you work for a small company, huh? Yeah, so relatively small. Yeah, they don't have any money, but they're using your money. They're stealing from you. That's what I thought. Well, I would just, I would con I'd contact the insurance company and say, I have canceled checks that show I paid it, and they are acting in this capacity, in my view, as your agent. And I suggest that you collect from them. In the meantime, I will anticipate the coverage will continue uninterrupted. Uh huh. Because you you didn't you wasn't you didn't select the uh, you didn't make the laws on Cobra. True. The law says that they must continue, and if I remember correctly, you have to make the payment to your former employer, who then passed it on to the insurance company. Right. That's the law. Yeah. You didn't. What I'm trying to get to is you didn't author that. No. So that I would, and the insurance companies are part of that contract. Mm hmm. I'd go back to the insurance company and say, these are copies of my canceled check. Take it up with your client. Right. I wondered if I should get a lawyer. Not yet. I hate to because... No, I don't think it's necessary. Expensive. I don't think it's necessary yet. No, but they... But they don't stand by. Take a deep breath. Okay. Your next stop, if that doesn't work, is with the, with, with the uh, I don't know what they'll call it in your state, something they'll call it banking and insurance. The insurance commissioner's office. I see. Because clearly your employer has, has made a very, very serious, grievous... Not error, but transgression. Right. They were actually using my money for something else. <laughs> you put it very succinctly. It's <laughs> exactly so. Right. That they have no right to do that. No. Well, that's, well, that's the route I, that I would try. Do it in my, along that channel and, and try to find out what's what. 
what? First go to the insurance company and explain mm-hmm. that. I, 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 I follow the letter, but I've called them. Right. And if they don't want to give you some kind of satisfaction right away, mm-hmm. you say to them, you know, this, these folks are acting, um, they, I have conformed with the law. And they are acting in my, this is what you're saying, in your opinion as your agent. Mm-hmm. And, the, and you're responsible for the actions of your agent. Now, I don't mean insurance agent, but agent no, in a broad sense. And I think at the same time, like tomorrow morning, I'd be on the horn with the insurance commissioner's office. Really? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it, it, it's awfully discouraging. Well, forget the discouraging. If you had a major claim, I could see everybody running for cover. Right. So I think I'd call the insurance agent, the insurance commissioner's office tomorrow morning as well. Very good. Thank you so much, Bruce. I wish you well, sweetheart. Well, these, these companies pay fast and loose with their employees' money. Something wrong with that. I mean, you, you got to steal someplace else. Will or in Michigan? Hello. Uh, hi, Bruce. Hi. Um, I got a little question for you. Yes, sir. I had a um, an ex girlfriend of mine who, at the time, was my girlfriend, and co-signed on a loan for a vehicle for me. Uh-huh. Uh, it was about a, about fifty two hundred dollars. Uh-huh. Um, we've since broken up, and she's out trying to get a, a mortgage on a house, uh-huh. and the mortgage company that she's trying to get the loan from has said that. The loan that she co-signed with me on is part of her monthly debt. That's absolutely true. Okay, uh, she wrote me a letter and was requested that I attempt to get the loan in my own name mm-hmm. by myself, mm-hmm. which I have, and my credit being bad. Um, oh, they, but she's stuck. Is there anything she can legally do to me? <laughs> no, there isn't. No, I don't think you dragged your chicken and screaming with a gun to her head to sign those papers. No, that, was her, that was her suggestion, actually. Right. Well, well, it doesn't matter whose suggestion. The fact right. is that she, she, she signed it gratuitously as a, a consenting adult, and she stuck with it to you pay her. Yeah, they told me after 12 months of payment that I would be able to uh, get it in her name. Well, that may be. But she stuck with it. There's nothing she can do, nothing but to you. You're perfectly safe. Fantastic. That's I wish you well, kid. Thank you very much. Hey, we're going to be here tonight from 10 p.m. right through 3 a.m. taking your calls at 800 743 I do hope you join me. Who's me? I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Night. Hey, Buffalo, let me remind you, we're going to be here tonight. Yeah, from 10 day p.m. to 3 a.m. I hope you and some of your friends will give us a call. What's on your mind? Hi, Bruce. I enjoy uh, your program very much. Well, thank you, guy. And uh, we run a dance here in uh, in town, and uh, we belong to Broadcast Music Incorporated. BMI. And ASCAP. And ASCAP. Now, I know that we have to belong to it, but I've asked to... Uh, have a list of songs. They can't give you one. Well, the thing is this. Why do I have to belong to two of them if we're not playing both of, you know, all their songs? Well, because you're going you're gonna to play. There's no way if you, if you play very much music, you're not going to play both. You're going to hit stuff that belongs to them both. These guys have got a monopoly, and there's very little you can do about it. And, you know, there's a couple of other companies around besides the two you got. Are you worried? I, guess, well, I, I, I am not familiar with the name. There's one that does essentially religious music. Uh, and you may hit one of those, too. No, we're strictly in the bar. Uh-huh. Well, I, but, but you still may hit a song that they that they have under their umbrella is what I'm trying to get. I see. But uh, I don't know where you're going to get that information. But you, if, if you play very much music, you're going to hit both BMI and ASCAP control stuff. So there's no way of getting away from it. Then. No, no. I, I don't agree with the whole concept of ASCAP and BMI. Personally, I think it's a fraud. But that's a personal opinion. The idea that the performer ought to get paid twice when he produces it and get a residual every time it's played someplace, I think that's absurd. Mm-hmm. I mean, the same performers that are getting residuals from guys like you and radio stations and whatever would send their wife or girlfriend down to the program director when they got a brand new release they want to get played. They kill to get it on the air because it doesn't get on the air. Nobody's ever going to buy it. Nobody's ever going to hear about it. I see. And yet, once it becomes popular, oh, hey, you're making money off of me and we want to get paid. I think the whole concept is absolutely specious, but then that's my opinion. It always will be. But it's one that's not shared by, obviously, by people in the music business. So there's no way that we can get it at all. A list? Yes. I doubt it. Have you requested one from me? Yeah, I've requested one, but... What, What do they say? They tell you there's too many to, to list. That's the problem. Suppose, I think that, and that's a hell of a system. With too many to list, but you can't play our stuff unless you pay us. Right. The whole they, system. They, they threaten to take you to court. Oh, they will. It's not a little threat. They will take you to court. They have a lot of junior grade bird men, little young attorneys that are pay, getting paid not a whole lot of money. They'll take you to court. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, then thank you very much. You're, you're stuck with it. The system, in, this, in my opinion, in this case is extremely deficient. Morgantown, West Virginia. Hello there. Good evening, Bruce. How are you today? I am well, thank you. I thought I'd check in. I'm a recent, well, soon to be college graduate, mm -hmm. and I'm pursuing a career in advertising. Getting ready to write this cover letter, and I thought I'd check in with the old master. What are we covering? I would like to write a cover letter to go with my resume, mm -hmm. and I need to just check in with you. And I, I've heard you say it before, heard your commercial, going to hang up after this and order one of those fine kits. Okay. But, um, Bruce, could you run through with me one more time? What do you like? I know you like double space. Uh, oh, well, first of all, I don't like resumes. Let's start with that. I agree. It's, it's unless, a unless it's been, resume. Unless it's been specifically requested, then the resume ought to be brief. Brevity is the, the, key, to, the key to the to some kind of success. But the cover, the letter, whether it's a direct letter or a cover letter, cover being in some other enclosure, it ought to make me believe, whether it's true or whether it isn't, that you really know who I am and you really want to work with or for me. Not that you want to work to, you to get a job. Right. I mean, I know you want to get a job because you got to eat and make car payments. I don't care about that. You are not my concern. I am my concern. What am I attempting to do? I, I'm sorry. Well, what I'm trying, I want you to persuade me that I'm going to be better off talking to you. Correct. And secondly, I want to be persuaded that you know who I am. It was to address the dear sir and madame. Hello. One of the things that really gives me a kick, I was talking to Dan about this because Dan produces another program for, for uh, our company. And you get these uh, mass mailings from Flax, you know, trying to, trying to push their, their client to get them interviews and so forth. And I'll get this stuff that'll say, we'd love to be a guest on your show. Well, what does that tell me immediately? I'd like to sell a book. No. That doesn't, no, serious now. Come on, man, get serious. Yes, sir. Did you ever listen to my program? Yes, sir. Actually, I've listened for about four years. All right. Then if somebody sends a letter and says they want to be a guest on my show, what does that tell you? Well, it tells me, first of all, that you don't do guests. That's right. You they never, they, guests that, they stop right there. They, they, they don't know my show. Right. Because clearly, if they knew, they wouldn't be requesting a guest thing. Right. So I am insulted. They don't know who I am or what I do. It goes right to can. The same thing is true when you send a letter to a company. If, 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 if there's a... In the letter, it, or to, to the, you know, maybe it's addressed to John Jones. Yes. But if there's anything in there to indicate where well, you make a mistake, you know, you tell them about the bubble gum they manufacture, and all they do is but manufacture denture-free gum, that's going to the can right away. you got to do your homework, is what I'm trying to tell you. Yes. And you got to persuade them that, by golly, this guy is going to look smart, or he's going to be more productive, or he's going to get a bigger bonus next year by talking to you. That's what we're looking at. And you got to figure out where his... His hot button is and, pro and probe it. That requires some effort on your part. Yes. You to make a phone call or two or six. What, what is your discipline? Advertising is a, uh, there's a school of journalism, huh. and uh, I'm looking at retail advertising specifically. Right. You, want, if you want to work for an agency, or do you want to work for? A, for I'd eventually agency? like to work for an agency. I don't think I'm ready right now. I'd probably like to start with a, a newspaper or a organization like that, get some experience. Mm -hmm. Well, a newspaper in what capacity? As an as an as an account exec? Yes, sir. Oh, that should be a cinch. Those kind of jobs are not hard to find. Uh, and, and they're harder to keep if you don't. That's you right. Don't well, that's yeah. right. As it, which is as it should be. I think so. Salesmen are very difficult to under uh, or overpay because they get paid strictly on what they produce. Yes. I, I know you own some radio stations, so I'm sure you have intimate experience with that. Well, I don't have much to do with that. Be candid with you anymore. Uh, you know, the folks that work for us are with us do that. But I do have, I, I do, I, I'm involved in, in, in more than one enterprise. And from time to time, I do get involved in the hiring process. And the first thing I'm looking at is, do they know who the hell I am or what I do? Let's take it down to the radio business, all right? All right. If, I don't do it anymore, unfortunately, but if I were choosing a staff member to work with me on, 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 on the company end, right? Yes. Now, you're 22 years old, something like that? Yes, sir. About 25, actually. Oh, okay. What's your first name? Bill. Bill walks into my office and you want to work with me on my show, right? Right. I'm going to ask you one question, Bill. If you get the answer, you and I may have it work together. If you don't have the answer, your history. What do you suppose that question would be, Bill? Who are the top ten radio... Oh, you've been listening. Thank you, sir. 
You've been listening. That's exactly right. That's my question. You, pardon? What you like names? Ah, that's what I want. I want names. Yes. And what they do, because that means you're interested in our enterprise. You're absolutely right. You can listen to my program. You heard me say that before, you rascal. Yes. That's that's okay. That's good. You see, you filed that away, and that's good. That says a lot for you. But th you, you understand why I would ask that question? Well, it's important to understand not only that you're the boss, but there are other people that are in direct uh, it's competition. More, it's, what more, are they doing? It's, it's more important to, to have demonstrated that you're interested an interest in the industry. That's what I. That's exactly right. That's what you did by having the answer to that question. Now, if you're going to talk about this this newspaper, you're going to apply to, right? Yes. Sir. You most certainly want to know the name of every single weekly shopping center news, daily, whatever in that area. And you want to know what they reach, who they reach. And you want to know who they're selling to. When you're sitting down with me and you say, well, I've noticed in the, in the, uh, the I'm trying to think about being a bad, you know, uh, the 15 cent shopper, but they have a number of ads that you guys haven't been able to sell. I'd like to take a crack at that. I see. You see what I'm getting to? Yes, sir. You may, they may have a good reason why they're not buying, but at least you've, you've taken the enterprise to, to do the research, what well, sets you apart from nine other guys that walk to the door? Why do you want to work for us? I love to work with people. Arf. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of people like that, Bruce, are not the kind of people that other people want to work with. Well, that's another program. <laughs> hey, good talking to you guys. Knock them dead. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talkin'. Lynchburg, Virginia. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Hello, Bruce. sweetheart. First, I want to tell you, uh, you're one of my two favorite programs. Okay. Uh, who's the other one? Uh, I like that Michael Feldman and What Do You Know? I really like that. That would be a local program, I think, huh? I don't know. It comes from Wisconsin College somewhere there. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm afraid I don't know Mr. Feldman. Go ahead. Okay. I'm, I'm writing a book. I have 1,400 letters of my husband's from World War II. And I'm writing a book of surviving those four and a half years, you know, daily on all the things you go through. Anyway, I did what you said. I sent to the Library of Congress for the um, copyright forms, and I got the writer's market book. But the writer's market book says it really isn't necessary to have a copyright. Well, for, for $20, does it really matter? No, it doesn't, except that I... What, the, what does the writer's book say? That you are the author and you I don't know. It? It's a reference book at the library. Yeah. That, you're that you own it automatically and all that sort of thing. Uh-huh. But a copyright is public notice of that. Okay. So do it anyway. Well, I mean, I don't think it matters a whole lot in this instance. You're going to try to, you're writing a book about your, your, your being a wife during World War II, huh? A wife and a husband and raising a child and staying in love and getting mad and making up and all the things I have daily report. I can tell you once or not you're saying something on such and such a date. Huh. And I don't know, it probably won't go anywhere, but it's worth a try. It might be fun. And I'm, I'm retyping it now to the format that uh, uh, the writer's market wants, you know. So I don't well, know. Wait a minute. No, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean, the, the, somebody, the, the format they want? What is that all about? Well, they tell you, you know, how, to in, how they want it. Are you, are you paying them any money? Oh, no, I'm typing it myself. I no, no. Are you paying this organization or anybody any money? No. Don't. Don't. There are a lot of outfits out there that will help you supposedly for a fee. Don't pay them a penny. Okay. What they're talking about is called the vanity, or in, in this case, the vanity press. Oh, okay. And no. Don't. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, well, I think the writer's market more than I said that. Okay. Well, I don't know anything about writer's market. I'm oh, just telling I you, as a general rule, I thought I heard if, that on your if somebody wants some money from you uh -huh. to help you publish your book, the answer is N O no. Absolutely no. Okay. Absolutely. I do wish you all, sweetheart. Uh, could I ask you one more question? Sure. All right. Now, in the book, I don't refer to names. I use Buddy or, um, well, I do name like the Palladium and, and the Coconut Grove and places that we went. But I don't name names. Now, is that okay? That's okay. Okay, and I just love your program. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Enjoy, my dear. To Rochester, W-H-A-M country. Hello there. Bruce, what an honor. Well, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Long-time listener, first-time caller. Yes, sir. But I want to discuss uh, something you tweaked me on the other night a little bit. Which was? Uh, dating back property while the home is under construction. Yeah, well, uh, not dating back. Selling is the word. 
okay. There's a major distinction between the two. Okay. How about in escrow with an attorney? No. No. Because that doesn't protect you. What happens to the, what, suppose you put the property in escrow, as you described, mm -hmm. and the builder goes belly up. What then? Well, he's improved the property. Yeah, he's improved the property, but there's gonna, he, you would have to subordinate your interest to the bank's interest or nobody would loan him any money. Well, let me run this scenario. All in the property, free and clear. Yeah. In lieu of sizable down payment. Yeah. Contract for a $200,000 house. Yeah. Builder holds property in lieu of down payment. Well, why would you give the builder a down payment? Well, he's going to improve the property. Oh, uh, who cares? Okay, whose who's liability is if someone gets hurt on the property? Yours. Not if I, I'm not holding the deed. Well, that's true, but that's a minor issue. You can protect that with a few bucks in insurance. That's not the major issue. How about the subcontractors? That's the major issue. There you go. Yeah, but your property then is in jeopardy. They can still file, no matter who owns the property, they can file a lien against it. You've accomplished nothing. Well, how do you, how do I get a builder that doesn't want a uh, hundred thousand to build a hundred, two hundred thousand dollar house? I don't know. You mean up front? Yeah. Well, I would, if I couldn't find one, I'd be ashamed of myself. We see the problem is you're deal, I, I, you're looking obviously for the best price and I can't hate you for that, right? Right. But you're also the guy saying, well, I need money for materials. That's correct. Well, I tell them, if you can't afford to dig into your pocket and pay for the materials, I don't want to do business with you. You're, you're, just, you're just too shaky. You're a nice guy, and let's do business 10 years from now when you're established. But if you've got to use my money to buy the, the material, I'm not interested. Right. Now, it, now, if he's, using, he's using the land as, as in lieu. The property's only worth 25000 All right. And he's going to put a $200,000 house on a third of an acre lot. What does that got to do with anything? He can, he, he in turn, he also can have liens against the property. See what, what I'm concerned. Yes, my, attorney, my, my attorney says that um, we don't close unless it's everything title free. All right. When we get back together again, I'm going to ask you, you, for, you ask you for your attorney how he guarantees all that. I'm Bruce Williams. Stick around. This is talk now. I am chatting with a gentleman in Rochester, New York, who's rich for having money and to build himself a quarter million dollar house. Not too shabby, huh? However, however, I don't have the quarter million. Well, but uh, you, you have the, the capacity to borrow, which is the American way. Yes, and I, the way I can borrow it is I own the property. Yeah, well, you know, well, that, that's that's not a completely accurate. You can borrow, even use the property for a down payment. You could use cash right. as well. But that's that's neither here nor there. The point, you see, what bothers me about this. Your, your, your attorney says, well, by golly, we aren't going to close unless we know that there's no liens in rubber. What? That's correct. But how do you guarantee that, Tony? Ask yes, your attorney that. In other words, what I want to know, there's no liens at the time of closing, but how do we know that every one of the subs has been paid, every one of the vendors has been paid? Because uh, at, at the same time of closing, I'm going to close with a $150,000 mortgage. What well, does that got to do with anything? Well, me and the bank are going to be in partners. That's that? fine, but what, what, that doesn't mean a damn thing. Well, you got a mortgage, but if somebody files a lien, and it's a legitimate mechanics lien, as an example, it's going to be behind in a secondary position, but that doesn't help you if you want to sell a place. You still got to pay it. Uh, it's my understanding in New York State that a mechanics lien must be filed prior to the transfer, and that's why they're holding the deed in escrow. That may, you, may, that you may, he may be correct in your state. I don't know the answer to that because it does, in some states, the mechanics lien has to be filed within so many days of the, of the stuff being delivered. It will vary from state to state. But the problem is that I know of no way, maybe, you're, maybe your attorney is correct in this regard, I'm certainly not going to contravene your, your attorney. I know of no way you can be adequately protected. You can see, unless, and the unless, and the way I want to be protected is with some kind of a bond that would pick up those obligations for a year or two. That that may be feasible because well, the, the the problem is is, is the sizable down payment. There are well, I don't, you see, I'm not interested in that either. You say, well, hey, he's improving my property. But my problem is, what happens if he goes belly up in the middle of this? And let's assume, for the sake of discussion, that uh, 
if he, he's got 50000 and he puts in $50,000 worth of work. If you think you're going to get somebody to come right in and pick up the ball without uh, causing you a lot of grief and extra expense, you're very much mistaken. That I can agree with. That I agree with. Uh, I just don't like to have these guys. You see, well, I, I can say, go ahead. The alternative is to go into uh, community or track type living. No, that's not, that's not true. That's not true at all. The alternative is to find a builder who is substantial enough to pay you $25,000 for that property and build a house on it to your specs and then sell it to you after the house is completed. Uh, that may be difficult in this area with the uh, white builders have been dropping it down and out. Ah, but now but you, <laughs> you, see, you put your but finger you on my concerns. I, listening. I told you I was a long-time listener, mm -hmm. and I found a guy that I feel is very, very okay. reputable. Well, you know, I'm not, you see, I know, let's, let's, let's separate some. A lot of, of very reputable, well-intentioned, and nice people will go yeah. belly up. Oh, I, I can appreciate that. So we, we, just because somebody goes out of business or fails, it doesn't mean they aren't the salt of the earth. It just means they had some tough breaks or made some bad decisions or who the hell knows yeah. what. But uh, I just think your position is so much stronger if they own the property because they, they have no leverage in Suppose for the sake of, I only got a few seconds. I'm talking more quickly than I would prefer. But uh, if you did it, my you do it the escrow way, right? Mm -hmm. And he drags his feet. What leverage do you have? Well, time, contract time. So what does that mean? Well, what does I, that mean? Try and collect them. I agree. But if the property all belongs to him, you say so long. It's been good to know you. You violated the contract. He's stuck. Just my opinion. I've seen so many people get burned. I don't want to see them get burned as well. That's the only major reason. We are going to be here from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. tonight, tomorrow morning, respectively. 800-743-8000 is the number. I'm Bruce for TalkNet. Yeah, everybody does. It actually has a specific meaning, though. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard you uh, talk about mobile homes. I know they're not your favorite. Well, I know, as an investment, I think they are not a good investment in most cases, and I'd, I'd be willing to argue that with almost anybody. Well, I deal, and, and I agree with you. Mm hmm but you do have to keep in mind also that many times, even on a stick-built home, mm -hmm. it's the land that's appreciating and not the structure. That's true, but frequent. Well, we can. Yeah, that, that that's true, but the the, the structure, a stick-built structure, is going to last a whole lot longer than a mobile home. And furthermore, uh, where I really object to mobile homes is in places like Florida. Oh yeah, no, I see. Because the point they just or, or any place that's subject to to violent storm action. Sure. Because mobile homes just don't get it. Every if you see a you pick up the, the, the newspaper or where you can see a picture or, or, or a television and there's a, uh, some kind of a violent storm activity and there's 50 houses wiped out, even money, those houses were mobile homes. Because oh, they agree. just aren't built for, for, for where. Absolutely. Uh, now, a modular home is a different animal. A modular home is virtually a stick-built home built in a controlled environment mm -hmm. under a roof. Right. And you'll find uh, sometimes superior construction features. Sometimes that's true. Where they put them together and then they set them in a couple of sections that go onto a f permanent foundation and get married together. Absolutely. And right. uh, in recent years, they've come to the point where I'll bet you dollars of donuts, you can't tell the difference once you're looking at it. Frequently, that's true. But, but you can tell when you're inside, though. Right, the, right up the street from where I'm speaking now, mm -hmm. there is a, a small... Well, we'll call it a bank. I guess it was a savings and loan. It doesn't really matter. But I remember when that was built. And the, I'll bet you not one person in 100,000 that drives down that highway ever thinks of that, that or ever in, never even a, it crosses their mind that it's not a traditional building. But I remember when they delivered that thing. It came in two chunks. <laughs> yep. Without the safe, i got to believe. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that's not an option on our list. <laughs> right. Uh only when it comes time to pay. But oftentimes in, in, in these, uh, in the, in the uh, modular homes, they do use things which were used in some stick-built houses too, like metal door frames and whatever. Oh, yes. Yeah. That, that are not, in my opinion, first quality. Mm -hmm. well, Is that not true? Well, it's true. Uh, however, the, the features, actually, you know how I can tell that the supplies come from the same companies, mm -hmm. whether it be the famous window company we sure. all know about. Mm -hmm. so forth and so on and kill drain kill dried lumber is you know no matter where you buy it's it kill dry and laundry lumber and anderson windows or anderson windows which there you're you referring go. to i'm sure mm -hmm. 
Go ahead. Uh, I just want to watch the brand names here. No, I said Anderson because that's the major, that's the brand that most people think of when they think of Windows. Sure, and those are available through me or any other dealer. Sure. You know, the gist of my question is, here I am outside of Rochester in Canandaigua, which is in... I know where it is. Okay. And it's in the cold area where the sun shines 50 days a year. Yeah, well, we've been lucky. <laughs> but, uh, if you're lucky, yeah. And I'm struggling, and... Uh, because some large corporations have been laying off. Like Kodak. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> Mobile's not helping either. I know the area. Go ahead. Now I'm thinking to myself, and this is partly because of you, I'm 33 years old, wife and kid, mm -hmm. not afraid to move around a little. Mm -hmm. uh, I found kind of a niche market in Long Island mm -hmm. over the summer. I went down there six or eight times. And uh, the cost of construction is so high down there. I think I can uh, basically compete. Why is the construction costs, or why are construction costs higher in Long Island than they are in Rochester? Uh, basically, be, uh, it's, it comes down to the subcontractors. They're all demanding more for their goods and services, and even the materials seem to be at a premium. Well, how can you buy the materials? I can understand where the services you might be able to compete. Or, or cut the prices. How do you, how do you, how do you cut the price on materials that you have to purchase in the same marketplace? The modular home would actually be constructed uh, in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. in four sections if it was a colonial. I see. Can you? Can, how about the building codes where you were thinking about going? Do they allow it? Because some places do not. Yeah, actually, the building inspector I talked to down there uh, had toured one of the plants that I'm, I'm a dealer for. Is that right? Yeah, and he was impressed. Okay, we only got about uh, 35 seconds here. Where are we going with all this? Uh, I was going to try to open an office down there and build some homes, but I'm 350 miles north. Well, why don't you go down there and leave your wife where she is? For long periods of time, sir? So what? Well, Guys who are in the Navy go out for six months and don't think much about it. That's well, true. It's kind of well, hurt on your marriage and your family. Well, I don't know if that's true. Let's, first of all, Long Island to Rochester is about a 50-minute airplane ride, and they got them, Continental has lots of stuff coming out of Newark. Yep. yep. So I don't, I don't see that's a hardship. I really don't. Would you have a tendency to find a niche market down there or in Florida? I hear all these I'd reasons. find a niche market wherever I could. Obviously, the difference in Florida, for, among other things, is climate. Yeah. And that's a made for, well, it was a big thing for me. That's why I'm a Floridian. I love that, cold, that uh, warm weather. But there's builders by the troves down there. That's another question. That, but you asked me, yeah. would I, at 33, I'd probably go where the money was. Where do you think it is, Bruce? Well, I can't tell you that. I, I, don't, I, I, cannot tell you. I think I can make money anywhere. What do you think? Yeah. I'm, I'm that egotistical. I can make money any place. Well, I admire you for that. Well, sometimes I've been right. Sometimes I've been dead wrong. i got to turn you loose, guy. But I would go where you're... But I, I certainly wouldn't move my wife and kids on a, on a whim. I have no problem with commuting. On, but businessmen are away all week long on business trips. What difference does it make? That's part of business. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Columbia, South Carolina. Hello there. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing very nicely, thank you. What's on your mind? Um, I was hired for a, a newspaper position, and uh, position. What does that mean? As a photographer. Okay. Um, I was told if I purchased my own equipment, that they would pay for all repairs. Are you on a cellular phone? No, sir. It's just a bad connection. I was told. Okay, go ahead. Um, and I'm having a problem now. I had a repair, and they're uh, giving me a problem about paying it. Um, I was wondering if I had any recourse without having anything in writing. Well, are you on the payroll? Yes, sir. How much is it going to cost to have the camera fixed? Um, it's a lens at $650. Wow, what happened? Um, it just, the uh, uh, main part inside broke out on it, and it was beyond warranty. And the company that I sent it to, the, the manufacturer, um, that is the repair bill. Hmm. Well, when you talk to the company, what do they say? You're up meaning the paper that you're employed yeah. with. They, uh, first they said they weren't going to pay anything. Um, I mean, I'm carrying around quite a substantial amount of equipment here. It would seem so. How much? Uh, probably about $10,000. Is that right? Um, and Does it take that much to be Casey crime photographer here? Well, I mean, the, the lens that was broken was a rather large lens used for sports. Mm -hmm. um, that is... Um, it's just it's a four thousand dollar lens. Um, a four thousand dollar lens. Yeah. For still photography. Mm-hmm. Is that really necessary? Yeah. Why? 
pictures in the in a newspaper at very best are are, are um, well. I mean, for for sports, you have to be able to see beyond where you would normally with just your basic equipment. Mm. Um, it's just a, a long focal length lens. Okay. Um, and first they said they wouldn't pay anything, and now they're offering less than half. And I mean, I'm just. You like your job? Um. I, I like what I do. I don't like how I'm being treated. I mean, well, what do you mean being treated? On this issue or other things? Well, this, among other things. I was also told that after three months I would uh, be given a raise. Mm -hmm. And when I uh, mentioned this to my supervisor, he said, do you have that in writing? Huh. And what did you say? <laughs> I mean, I did not come here thinking that I'd have to get everything in writing. And I'm yes. sure if I asked for it in writing, they wouldn't give me the job. Well, without regard to that, you, the, your answer could be, I'm sure I'm dealing with honorable people. Why would it be necessary to put it in writing? Right. That's what I would have said. And what, So what, they didn't give you the raise, huh? No. What are your job prospects elsewhere? Um, I've been looking, and it's a very tight market right now. And keep your mouth shut. Take the half. That's what I kind of figured. No, that doesn't mean I wouldn't be looking because it would oh, appear. Oh, yeah, I understand. It would appear that you're dealing with some people who are, should we be charitable and say less than honorable? Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, why cut off your nose? Right. But, but I'd be out there looking, but I'd take the half and swallow hard. Okay. Thank good, you very much. Good luck, guy. Goodbye. Where are we going from South Carolina? We're going north to North Carolina. Fayetteville. Hello there. Fayetteville, are you there? Every time I give a soliloquy, they go away. Cincinnati, are you there? Hello? Hello there. Hello, I'm uh, I'm about to embark on a project, and I want to get your input on it. Let's talk. I'm going to uh, put out a cassette album. Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about uh, help asking my friends to help me market it. But... Well, hold on, take a deep breath. You say album, I take it we're talking about music. Yes. Because there are other kinds of albums. Okay, and what? this is your own music? Yes, totally original. You're performing? Yes. All right. Now, gonna, getting the cassette made is the easiest part of this equation, clearly. Right. Now what? Now you got a cellar full of, of cassettes. What next? Well, I'm only starting with 50. I'm starting out very small. And well, the first one's the one that costs you the money. The rest of them are cheap. <laughs> yeah. The first one, it costs you how much? I think I, I'm going to probably get get into these for under $2 a piece, not including my labor. For a hundred bucks? Yeah, I don't... In including the master? Okay, well, I no. Well, the master... <laughs> I was talking duplication cost. I'm... Duplication couldn't, shouldn't cost you more than 45, 50 cents. Okay. But the master, what'd that cost? I'm thinking, uh, well, I've got a dat machine. I own a recording studio, so I'm going to be able to produce it myself. I haven't okay. analyzed it. You own a studio? Yes, huh? A real legitimate music studio. A small one, but uh, I okay. love music, and I've been involved with it all my life. But basically what I'm calling about, I wanted to get an agreement together to ask other people to help me market this product and uh -huh. what would make it worth their while to do so. I'm thinking about possibly, uh, you know, selling them selling a minimum of 10 tapes and getting a certain percentage. All right, fine. And what, what, kind, of, what kind of agreement would that be you called? Don't have to, you mean a written agreement? Yeah. What for? Okay. What for? You give them the tapes, they sell them, they get a PC. Okay. I don't think it's necessary to have a written agreement for That's that. That's fine. I, mean, I, I assume that you are... If it's your own material, you don't have to worry about ASCAP or any of those guys, right? Yeah. There's no licensing fees involved. Okay. I, I, I further assume that you copyrighted your music. That's an easy thing to do. Yeah. And beyond that, yeah, here they are. Whatever the sale price is, you get half or whatever the PC is. I don't think it's at all necessary to have a contract. That's fine. Uh, you know, I'd rather not have to go through the hassle. I, don't th I see no reason for it. I'm, I'm going to you know, put an 800 number on it and so forth. Good. Make a ton, kid. <laughs> we'll do the best we can. Our telephone number 800 743 which is good right now as we speak and we have an open line. Or, alternatively, between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. Eastern Time, Dan and I'll be here. Dan having his little glass of wine and French bread. And me, I'll be chatting with you. Look forward to seeing you then on this with us. This is Talk Talk. Yeah, Danny and I will be here tonight taking your calls at 800 7438 from 10p to 3 a.m. Eastern Time. Savannah, Georgia, welcome to my world. Hello, Bruce. How are you doing? I'm just fine. You, sir, are the guru of good sense. <laughs> Thank you very much. Listen, I have a problem with an auto mechanic. Mm-hmm. 
I took my car to him back in in May of this year and uh, wanted to have it fixed, and he fixed it. Mm-hmm. Well, lo and behold, it broke down a second time. Same malady? Same problem. Mm-hmm. And then a third time, hmm. same problem. Can you tell me what this problem was? Yeah, it was a starter and alternator problem. Well, can you be a little more specific? Yes, sir. One, uh, it was shorting out the system. What uh, was... <laughs> I'm not an electrician, so I don't no, know a lot about it. what was shorting out this? You said a starter and an alternator. Right. He had the starter. He was working on the starter, and he was working on the alternator. And what how, did, how in the world are the two? It, it's all. It's an electrical system in a in a in a VW Fox, and it just didn't work very well. And the car would, was losing its charge continuously. What would I have to do with the starter? Except maybe a solenoid was shorted. I don't know what it was. Uh, anyway, he said he had a. He finally found the short after the third try. And I paid him $125. Well, he all, said, to, all together? Y- yes, sir. All right. Did he and, replace? Did he replace his starter? Yes, he, he well, he re- he rebuilt it. Well, same thing. Okay. Well, then he told me to come get it. Mm-hmm. I said okay. I drove down there to get it, and the car wasn't ready. It was still broke, and not only that, it was mired in up to its axles in mud, and had to be pulled out of a hole in order to get the thing out, so he could even look at it again. Where did you did you take this to a dealer or to a? a Regular mechanic or some shade tree mechanic? Well, he's got a shop here uh, locally, yeah. and he advertises and everything. So, I, and I checked him out, and he's he's registered as a business in in one of the towns here. So that doesn't tell you anything. Well, I, well, I did what I could to try to find out what I could about him. Well, how did you select him over ten other guys? Uh, I saw an ad in the Yellow Pages. Interesting. Okay, I mean, I, if I, I mean, it's like I'm serious now. Was his parking lot not paved? No, sir. It was. Uh, uh, it's it's dirt. Well, there you see that right there. <laughs> that would have made me think of three times right there. How if you're if you're in the if you're in the the mechanics business, what are you doing with a dirt parking lot? Either you're broke, or you could. I'm, well, you're laughing. I'm serious. I don't do business with people who aren't solvent. Well, you're right about that. You're absolutely or, or I try right. to find out they're solvent. Now, great, granted, uh, trapings are not necessarily <laughs> a good indicator. But anyway, the guy can have an expensive suit and be broke. Yeah. But there's more chances that the guy has a threadbare suit that he's broke. That's true. Well, I dealt with this guy as best I could. And the short of it was I had to have the car towed off and taken to another mechanic. Mm-hmm. And it cost me uh, $50 to do that. Grand total, $175. I'm out. And I'd like to try to get my money back. Well, how about, well, wait a minute. How about the repairs? Have you had your car repair? Yes, I have. And what'd that cost you? $350. What was wrong with it? Uh, he said he rebuilt the starter and the uh, restarter and uh, checked out the alternator and made sure that the shorts were indeed gone, and they are, and the car's running, and it's fine. Hmm, that seems like an awful lot of money for a rebuilt starter. Yeah, well, you know, th- this guy came recommended to me. Without regard to that. It still seems like a lot of money for a rebuilt starter. But <laughs> boy. I, I, you know, it, it makes it kind of tough when, when you, you can do things in business, but you have no idea what mechanics you know, how to work on a car or anything. How old are you? Uh, 32. Yeah, you're, you're kind of a, a symbol of your generation. You really are. Yeah, I tell you, it's frustrating, Bruce. It really my is. My generation, the kid, you know, you, you just knew about cars. You just knew about these things. I mean, you, you started when you were 14 and you learned. And I see so many people of your generation don't know enough to put water in a battery. You say, well, I'm not a mechanic. <laughs> well, I can do more than that. I well, can no, think- I'm serious. I don't mean this. I'm not criticizing you. I'm thinking a general observation. Well, you know, you're right. A generational observation. You're right. My, my wife even suggested later on that I go to this local technical school and uh, take a course on how to fix it. Right. Well, now it could be argued with some justification that the uh, complexity of today's cars is not even to be compared to the simplicity of a generation ago. That's true. And that, yeah, the carburetor versus fuel injection, uh, electronic ignition versus a very simple ignition, those sort of things. But even there... It's cert- I mean, I, I got involved today in a, where uh, a used truck was being purchased. Now, I, I mean, I don't claim that I know a hell of a great deal, but on the other hand, um, I had some idea what we're talking about with the money. I got talking to the mechanics. Gee. Anyhow, you want to get your money back, the likelihood is you're going to have to play the small, cl- uh, small claims court game. But, but I heard you say the other night, a couple seventy percent of the claims are not collected. You got it. Yes, yeah, and that uh, I can't change that. Okay. I just be, want... The thing is, be in the thirty percent. Okay. How'd you how'd you pay this guy originally? Cash. 
Why? He wrote me a receipt, and I have the receipt. Why? Because he doesn't take he doesn't take uh, checks or anything. Why? Wouldn't that make you nervous too? Uh, well, I dealt with a second guy, and he's the same way. So. Uh, what kind of people do you have in your area? You don't take checks. Don't take. How about credit cards? No, they didn't take any of that. Well, I if you if a businessman won't take credit cards or checks, I won't do business with him. Well, that's good advice. I'll take Period. That. I'll take that. The reason I was I asked you about the check, if you paid him by check, you'd know where he banked. That's true. And you could attack his bank account if you got a judgment. But if I walked into a businessman, and I'm going to hear, in fact, I want to hear these guys are going to call me and say, but Bruce, I've been stuck with this. I've been tough. That's part of the hazard of, and if you don't want to get stuck for checks, pay the 1% to a check guarantee company. I don't know it's necessary. Uh, I don't want to pay the 3% to the credit card company. Well, that may be. And I have no problem with cash when I walk in to buy a sweater or a pair of shoes or, or something of that nature. But you go and just get something that can be questioned, like a repair such as you've described, and the guy only wants cash, get nervous. Okay. Well, I'm a retailer, and I take all three. Of course. <laughs> okay. And with a smile on your face. You got it. Good not luck, like, guy. Not like some of these customer service situations you've been talking oh, about. Yeah. How in heaven's name do these people... Well, you're a retailer. Right. How in heaven's name do you think these guys stay in business doing what they're doing? I don't know. I, I know I know what my policy is, and my policy is uh, you can never win an argument, and I'd rather walk out of here with uh, half of a smile on their face and, and to be angry at us and tell 20 other, other exactly. friends. Exactly. If you can only neutralize them, they keep their mouth shut, you're ahead of the game. Well, if they if they get good service, they tell five people. If they get bad service, they tell 20. Make it 500. <laughs> I wish you well, guy. Thank you, sir. I'm Bruce Williams. Stick around. This is TalkNet. Ordinarily, I'd say aloha if I was talking to Hawaii, but it's Oregon. Aloha, Oregon. Hello there. Hey, hi, the wilds of aloha. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I get a feeling that the really is a swing in town, huh? <laughs> Ooh, yes, all 7,000 of us really. Those sidewalks, I mean, they're open until 7 or 8 o'clock every night. <laughs> yeah, we're about to close down, so I better talk fast. Um, I've been losing sleep over something, and I value your opinion. What are you losing sleep over? Um, well, I have a, a kind of bizarre personal situation in the sense that I'm a single person, divorced for five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, between a very small inheritance and my own hard guts and work, I've managed to get a small portfolio of about $120,000. Right. Well, most people would be elated, and believe me, I am, and I'm grateful. But, but here comes the but. Yeah, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Um, I realize I'm kind of an adult now, and I have to get serious. I'm tired of living in an apartment. Well, hold on. You, you say you're kind of an adult. How old are you? Oh, uh, 42. 42. Yeah. That makes I, you kind of, I, well, I think that you qualify as an adult, at least <laughs> at least chronologically. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. I act 13, I feel 17, but biologically I'm 42. There you go. Okay. Okay. We're well, not going to hold that, we're not going to hold that against you too terribly much. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm a professional musician, and mm. I'm not the flaky kind. I'm I'm very responsible and I've done very well. But I can't get a mortgage because I don't have regular employment. And I was going to ask your opinion on whether it's, I wanted to put maybe like 65 to 80, maybe down, or maybe, well, actually more realistically 90, and just buy it outright without paying all that well, horrible, exorbitant interest. Well, first of all, it, interest is not necessarily either horrible or exorbitant. Interest is reflection of the cost of the value or the value of money. I thought it was like three times like the type of your house. Like if you buy a house, no, no, no we're not. That, that, that's over a three times that, the value and interest. That's a different issue. No, it has nothing to do with anything. That is no relevancy. Oh, it doesn't really. I don't want to give the banks any more than I have it, to. It, it has no relevancy. Oh. On a given day, money has a value in terms of its value to someone else. When you borrow money. You are renting the use of someone else's money. Uh -huh. If you invest money, you are collecting rent on the use of your money. Uh-huh. It just is that, does that make any sense to you? Oh yeah, I like okay. that. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, would you not agree that rentals will vary? Uh-huh. In, 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 if you want to do it by neighborhoods, and we can use neighborhood as a time frame. In one neighborhood, you may pay ten dollars. Another neighborhood, twenty, and still another thirty. And the big mall, 35. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Same thing is true with money. Now, you say you want to give the bank any more or any less. 
you have to think not in terms of what you're giving them back. That's not a reference point that is worthwhile. Mm. What is worthwhile is the spread. And I'm not talking about when you sit down in a chair. <laughs> I mean, we can all deal with that, right? <laughs> yeah. That's not the spread I had in mind. <laughs> what I'm talking about is the difference between what you're... Right now, you mentioned you have 120 big ones mm -hmm. stashed. Now, yeah, thank God, yeah. All right. Now, we're getting toward the end of the year, tax year. Mm -hmm. How much did that money earn you this year? Well, only about four or 5000 All right. Well, that's, that's all for the 120 grand. Mm -hmm. Well, it only earned you about 25 to 3%. That's not too, and that's before taxes. Ooh, crap. Ooh. So it didn't earn you a whole lot. Mm. Given that condition, I think you probably made some poor investments, but given that, that circumstance, if that is the case, if those numbers are accurate, you'd be far better off to pay cash. Because if you were to borrow that same amount of money, let's say $100,000 for the sake of discussion, let's assume it made you $5,000, you earned 5%. On which you probably, how much do you earn on your job? <laughs> well, it varies. I can earn, well, you, it averages only about um, 1200 a month, maybe. That's what you're making? That's good. Well, I'm not working very, I've traveled <laughs> a lot. I mean, that's, that's, I could earn more. <clears throat> I'm, now that I've settled down, I'm definitely planning to earn more. Oh, uh, you're, you're kind of a latent flower child, huh? You got it. <laughs> but I'm responsible. Well, all right. Yeah. Well, the thing is, then you're not paying much in taxes. I was trying to get the tax impact. On the on the five thousand dollars, it probably only in your case um, about seven hundred fifty dollars in taxes. Yeah, well, I declared about fifteen last year. Oh, uh, it's same same number. You're mm -hmm. still in that fifteen percent tax bracket, and then there may be a state tax to deal with as well. Okay. So your net return was only on the uh, taking in that five thousand gross number. The net return was only four thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. Ew. Because you should take the taxes off, and if you put the money into the bank. I'm sorry. If you if you borrow the money from the bank today, you probably have to borrow eight thousand eight at eight percent. You'd pay eight thousand, yeah. and you might get a little bit. You get a fifteen percent in your case tax break, which would be twelve hundred, right? So yeah. your net cost would be sixty eight hundred dollars for the money, mm -hmm. and your net return on the same money was only forty two hundred and fifty dollars. So wow. it would pay you to use the cash. You see. Yeah. yeah but now, if you had put the money into some kind of a European growth fund. And you made twenty five percent on your money, then you say, "Well, I don't want to give that up for nine percent." Well, uh, the, some of the funds are making that kind of dough. That's true. Well, I did last year, but this year was, you know. Mm, okay. Well, you have to deal on averages. Mm -hmm. Now, as to the 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 see, you, you're you're getting, you can't have it both. What's your first name? Uh, Tasha. 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 My goodness, you do exotic dancing too. <laughs> oh, my. Huh. Yeah, you know, a little fan dance on the side. Yeah, yeah. why not? All right, gotcha. Arushki. Yep. In any event, uh, <laughs> if you told me you made 50 grand last year, I may have a different answer for you, see? Mm -hmm. But you didn't. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was thinking maybe getting a Susie secretarial type of thing so that well, see, I could get a mortgage. But well, the thing is that with, with $12,000, Tasha, I don't care if you're doing the fan dance or your Susie secretary, you're not going to get much of a mortgage. Well, maybe better just to decide on a property and pay for most of it. And well, what you're telling me is that you either are beating the government on the income tax, or you're making very little. I'm making e very little. Either, ver either way, your your tax return that they're going to look at to see what you're earning. Right. At given that circumstance, unless you earn more, there is no mortgage in your future. Yeah. What uh -huh. do you What do you do? You said I got to let you go. What do you do musically? I uh, teach privately clarinet, saxophone, and flute, and I have a wedding and party band. Oh my goodness! And yeah, you want to make twelve grand? Yeah, well, you do a lot of play. A lot. I've been kind of um, finding myself after my divorce, but you're, you're doing a lot of pl you're doing a lot of playing, aren't you? Well, playing around. No, no, I'm. I'm no, I'll bet that too. I'm sure. <laughs> what did you used to play? Because I remember I heard you once say you were a musician. Wait, uh, I used to I used to, I used to do a little keyboard. Oh, neat. Okay. Oh, no well, more. I'm I'm plugging in. I'm not proud of making so little, but it's going to change. But um, well, you I, certainly should be proud of what you've acquired. You've done well with that kind of an income, Tasha. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm believe in the work ethic. <laughs> I do wish you well, sweetheart. Thank you. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in for more. This is Talknet, Charlottesville, Virginia. Hello. Hi, Bruce. I got a question for you. When I travel for business. The company that I work for pays for a town car to take me to the airport and then on to the hotel when I arrive in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And when the company pays, it includes a tip. So my question is, should I also give my own tip? And if, if so, um, how much? Well, <clears throat> ordinarily the answer is no. 
And this is that. If, if the gratuity is included, I love this when you when you rent a limousine or whatever, and they say uh, four dollars an hour plus fifteen percent driver gratuity. Mm -hmm. That's no gratuity. It's a service charge. Right. I mean, gratuity comes from the word gratuitous, which means it, it, it contradicts the term. So, so your suggestion would be none. The answer is no for the average guy. Uh, if the guy gives extra special service, you have to hang out or listen, would you run the drugstore and get me something? That's a little different matter. Mm -hmm. But on balance, the answer is no if, they, if, the, if it's included. Mm -hmm. Although, if again, if you're a high-profile person, I, I, I suppose I fit that category, then i got to reach in for a little bit. And if you, okay, if it was you and it was, say, an hour and a half drive. At what, what's, what's the rate? At, uh, let's say that, let's say the whole thing is, let's say it's a hundred dollar ride. And that yeah. would include a 15% tip or something. If you want to throw an extra 10 bucks, that'd be, he'll, he'll be happy. Thank you very much. I do wish you well. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, PA, hello there. Hi, Bruce. Thank Hi. you for taking my call. You're most welcome. First time, uh, caller and a long time listener. I need some advice on life insurance. Let's talk. Okay, I'm 70 years old. In 1987, I bought a uh, 30000 life insurance policy. $30,000 what? Uh, increasing uh, premium whole life insurance policy. In increasing? Yes. Increases every year? Uh, five every years? Ten years. Every 10-year level, okay. Yeah. Uh, what happened was uh, two years later, my wife passed away. Now I wonder if I should keep it or uh, drop it. What's the purpose of the insurance? Why did you take it out? Well, uh, I'm going to leave, you know, something for uh, expenses after something well, happens. Well, you're going to have one hell of a final funeral for 30 Gs. Yeah, well. Uh, the question it, is, you see, it's not a foolish question. And, and conditions change. I asked you why you took it out. I think a decent answer probably would have been, hey, I wanted my wife to have the money. Oh, yeah, at the time, yes. Yes, but, but, but that condition has now changed. changed. Yeah, my, uh, my daughter thinks I should drop it. Well, uh, we're back to this, but you're not. You're you're doing a lot of uh, fancy footwork here. What is the purpose of the life insurance today? Today, well, like uh, like I said, the, uh, to leave something in case uh, for my uh, burial expenses or stuff like that. Are you gonna have a pretty fancy funeral for six, seven thousand dollars? That's right. What else? What other reasons? Uh, that's it. Do you have any other assets? Yes. What are they? Well, I have uh, investments. I mean, amounting to how much? Uh -huh. Uh, uh, but uh, six figures, you know. In six figures, all right. How about the pension, that sort of stuff? Well, I get the uh, I get a pension. Uh, uh, I get uh, well, Social Security plus pension uh, every month. Yes. How much? Uh, about a thousand dollars a month. In, in total. In total, about uh, nineteen hundred. All right. In addition to that, you have your investments. Right. Well, and do you have, do you have any other life insurance in place? No. See, the reason I ask uh, is this increasing your premium uh, uh, after the 10th year, it goes up to 18, then uh, on the 20th. Oh, well, hold on. Take a How much goes up to what? Uh, uh, after 10 years. Yeah. It, uh, see, now it's $450 a year. Much well, cheap enough. Okay. Now, after, uh, on the 11th year, it goes to 1800 and uh, on up to... Hold it. Hey, you're talking too fast. Okay. At the 11th year, I'm, it goes I'm, to... I'm, I'm real nervous. Listen, the 11th year, it goes to how much? 1800 Jumps from 400 to 18 Right. And then... then uh, on the 20th year, it goes to $7,400. 7400 A year, yes. Boy. It's uh, pretty high, isn't it? When, and you took it out at what age? Uh, 67. So at 87, it goes up to 7400 a year. Right. And it, and, and, and it continues forever. Yes. Uh, well, it goes up, uh, uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, it's, uh, let's see, up to two... Well, I don't see any great need for the insurance for you, frankly. You want to keep a few bucks for the a burial policy, but the balance, I think I'd probably let go. I think your daughter's right. Hey, we're going to be here tonight at 800 743 from 10p to 3 a.m. Please join us. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. There was, in fact, a will file. A will uh, probated. And for a couple of bucks, they'll mail you a copy. Okay. Or you can go down and pick one up. Well, you're right there in town. You just go pick one up. Right. I do wish you well, guy. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. You're very welcome. Always amazes me, though, that you have families that are living in a... I mean, they live in a little dinky town. And for 10 years, they don't get together until somebody dies. And then all of a sudden, there's a lot of interest. Omaha, your turn. 
Hi, my name's Tim. Yes, Tim. Um, I had a question for you. Uh, I'm a, a graphic artist here in town. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering how I could go about getting my name trademarked or copyrighted. Well, you can, you can trade. Why do you want to get your name? Um, well, I do a lot of freelance work right now, and um, I've run into a lot of problems with people. I do designs for them, and they would take my stuff and get it done made somewhere else. And Well, that, that, that has nothing to do with your name. Uh, I didn't know if there's a way I could have, like, I don't so know. They, if they, I well, let's take, take a deep breath. Okay. You can copyright each of the works that you do. Okay. I, I believe a, 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 a literary, or I guess you'd come under literary someplace, that you have you have proprietary ownership there anyway. They can't do that, but you can certainly copyright it for twenty bucks a pop. Okay. And how would I go about doing? You call that? the Library of Congress. You can call information at two o two. You're going to get a machine. Okay. And one of those, if you have a, if you have a if you have a touchstone phone, you know, uh -huh. jump through jump through a hoop and spit nickels in a corner and. One of those numbers, and they'll tell you what you have to do. Okay. And they'll they will they will mail you forms, the whole routine. It's very simple to do. But the what well, the what you're talking about though is is a pretty common practice. Okay. Where, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get to is a common practice of screwing people. Right. Of asking them for for uh, proposals and whatever, and then going after and doing the proposals, but with somebody else. Exactly. And right. that's the problem I'd run into. I'd do design work, and then like a couple months later, I'd see it on a T-shirt or on an ad or something like that. Right. I didn't get anything for it, but I did all the work for it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not uncommon, kid. Okay. Not, un not uncommon at all. All right. Well, thank you very much. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in for more. I'm glad you're here. This is TalkNet. For some reason, I almost said St. Thomas, but it's St. James, Missouri. Hello there. Well, Bruce. Hi. This is Paul. Yes, Paul. What can we do for you? I need some advice in, I guess you'd say, marketing or advertising. Well, what are we marketing and or advertising? Well, back in 91, shortly after Desert Storm, I had written an essay about the flag. It was supposed to be a military funeral from the flag's perspective. Hmm. Got some rave review, reviews about it, and people suggested I have it printed into a poster, which I did. Rave reviews from whom? Uh, local civic leaders, uh, some military personnel, printers, things of that nature. Okay. I, was, I, I wasn't trying to put you down. I was just oh, wondering, you yeah. know, who said, you know, who, this is right after Desert Storm. Yeah, right. And we had, a, we had a, 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 a spasm of patriotism, which unfortunately... Died off quick. Boy, did it ever. Um, but the sales of the poster, even though it's got like a color flag at the top and an eagle shadowed in the background, et cetera, et cetera, and they're hand-signed and numbered... Uh, sales did not go well at all. It took two years to sell enough just to pay the printer for the first thousand. Yeah. And I have tried both articles and ads in newspapers in the Midwest. I even had an article that was done about it for a military newspaper, you know, like a base newspaper mm -hmm. in the Midwest. And nothing has seemed to work. Patriotism is not a hot item. Unless there's a war. So I need to stir up a that, war? Oh. That's about the size of it. Well, you know, during the, during the, the, the war, Desert Storm and so forth, mm -hmm. God Bless America was, a, was played all over the place. When was the last time you heard it play? I don't even remember hearing it then. Well, you did. I mean, they were playing it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the point is, when was the last time you heard it now? That you have it. Right. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be pessimistic for you, but I, 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 I'm obliged to. So you think I've hit everything that I can in terms of what would be affected? I think you have to wait for the next war. Okay. Unfortunately. That's a sad commentary, isn't it? They always say that advertising doesn't cost, it pays, but it hasn't shown well, that it, yet. Well, it pays, but you, you know, you, if you're advertising ice cubes in the middle of the winter in Alaska, the market may be somewhat weak. Mm -hmm. You still got to have something people want. Right. Advertising pays because you make people aware of what is available, but if they don't want it, period, doesn't matter that it's available. Okay. And I think that's probably the case here. Okay. I wish I had better news for you. Well, you at least gave me a little direction. Take care, guy. Thanks a lot. Charleston, South Carolina, hello. Bruce? Hello there. Hi, this is Gretchen. Yes, Gretchen. I have a quick question for you. I won't take up a lot of your time. 
listen well, to your are. program often and appreciate it. And I uh, thought maybe you could help me out this evening. I will do my very best. That's uh, you can depend on. Okay. Um, I have a package that was sent. Well, it's en route. Let me just say it never got here. My mm -hmm. father sent it through the post office. And I'm wondering, he didn't pay, he didn't get insurance on it, but I'm wondering if there's any recourse that can be taken with the post office. How long has it been missing? Um, about, uh, about two and a half weeks. Oh, forget about it. Even if it was, even if it was insured, they don't look for it for a month. They make no effort. All right. For a month. I sent an insured package, no, it's about a month ago, took 40 Three or 47 days to go a thousand miles. Insured. Insured. I sent another package uninsured, which we still wait to find. That's four months. And, well, the only thing is, is that I guess there's really no way they can trace it. But what kills me is that he also sent a package um, a week after that, mm -hmm. which I got right away. Right. And. Oh, look, I've used the post office and had excellent results. I also was a, I sent two uh, checks here about a month and a half ago. They have never turned up. Uh, the, I, 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 as God is my witness, I insured a couple of packages and sent them. I insured them primarily so I could keep track of them. One of them, one of them was delivered inside of a week. Deliver, most they were mailed from the same post office. The other one got to my home, addressed to me, perfectly correctly addressed. Took them 47 or 48 days, something that order. When I went back to the postmaster, he shrugged his shoulders, so I can't tell you where they've been. Well, uh, the answer there is if you got something, at the very least, you insure it, and if, very frankly, I'd send it to UPS, American Exp or uh, Federal Express, or whatever. I would not use the post office if it was something important. So it was probably stolen or just lost? I don't want to speculate on that. Uh, all right. I, I, mean, I wish I had a better answer for you. But they, 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 the post, they'll tell you, well, they'll try, and I'm sure they do try, but there's no mechanism built in for tracing. Now, the people in the post office could respond very correctly. Uh, they're the cheapest. Are you with me? Blind demand, yeah. Pardon I, me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've been, I mean, you, I've sent a whole bunch of stuff out uh, FedEx. I have a package coming to me tomorrow. It's going to cost probably 50 bucks. Right. Where it might cost $4 at a post office. But I'll be willing to bet you I got it tomorrow morning. I, I guess would my make, father just, you know, I would make people that, who grew up with a lot of faith in the post office. Yeah, when, <laughs> I hear you. I wouldn't make that wager with a postal. I mean, I'm, I don't, and I don't mean, well, let's face it. They handle billions, that's with a B, of pieces of paper and whatever. And they do it on balance. Of fine, it's, a, it's a bargain. It's cheap. But cheap is always not the least expensive. Uh, yesterday, I had a call from a lady who uh, has sold a, a piece of real estate for me. The contracts, blah, blah, blah. I said, FedEx, or I said, she's going to mail them. I said, whoopsie, you're going to FedEx them to me. 7.15 this morning, I got a phone call from the FedEx driver. And because you have to include your phone number, that kind of stuff. Right. And this thing, this lady really, really mislabeled the envelope. Oh, man. Well, it's okay. At least I know where it is. And I'm yeah. going to get it tomorrow morning. Yeah. Now, can you imagine a postman calling me on the phone and saying, hey, this is up in uh, the other part of the state. But I'm gonna. Can you have, have you ever got a phone call like that from a postal employee? No. <laughs> but this was the UPS driver that called on his. I'm sorry, the Federal Express driver that called on his own. Right. At seven fifteen this morning. Well, I know that they're very reliable. Obviously, I'm in business, and, we and you pay for it. Time, but and you pay a premium for that. Well, it's worth it, obviously. <laughs> well, to me, it is. I, I rarely send anything through the mail that I really think is important. I mean, bills and whatever, sure. Right. But if I have to get something to I'm, I'm one of our offices, and we, you know, we, we move stuff back and forth because we're scattered all over the country. Uh, we just gave up. We use the courier services. Now, the people in the post office could argue and argue very correctly that the cream is going. They got to carry the junk mail. Uh, they've got to take the stuff that for the you know first class. And it's a bargain. Twenty nine cents from Bangor, Maine to Los Angeles. That's one hell of a bargain mm -hmm. if it gets there. Right. But it's no bargain when it doesn't. And I suspect that 99.999% do get there eventually. So I can but just pretty much write this off? I don't, I don't no, it may, it may turn up uh, two and a half weeks. Is not, in my case, what was I? I just got through telling you. It was seven weeks, something like that. God. It okay. may turn up. Well, I but I wouldn't hold my breath. No, I know. Okay. Merry Christmas, baby.
Uh, unfortunately, those are the facts. I'm sure, and as I say, this is not putting down anybody in the post office department because they do handle and handle well tons and tons and tons of stuff. But on two occasions that I used them recently, three, two out of the three, one never got there, one got there on time, and one got there very, very late. And, and, and with all candor, though, we do use the post office in our business where we mail uh, the books and stuff that we sell, and we've had little problem there. So on balance, they do fine, but if you really have something that's important, maybe express mail might be the answer. And there is, a, oh, by the way, they do hold an advantage there. Let's give them their due. They will deliver on Saturday at no extra cost, even on Sunday, which the uh, overnight services charge dearly for. So there are some advantages. Ames, Iowa, hello. Bruce. Yes. Hello. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Pleasure here, kid. I've uh, listened to you for many years. You kept me well, company. Good. Here is my situation. It's not an earth-shaking problem, but I wanted your opinion. I've been in business for 13 years now, baking cookies, believe it or not. I believe it. And uh, I've done quite well at it. And my theory of business is, is quite simple. Um, I want to serve a good product, a clean store, friendly service, and all that kind of stuff. And I think the customers will come back to me, and they have. Mm -hmm. I am a member of the Chamber of Commerce, and it's time to renew my dues. And when push comes to shove, I really don't think it's worth it to be a member, and I wanted your thoughts on that. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what your chamber does. I know that in our businesses, we belong to most of the chambers where our businesses are located. Really? Yeah, it's a good place to meet people in the same, not the same business baking cookies, but they have the same problems you have with taxes and government and uh, whatever. Right. And you, I mean, it's not a big deal. What does it cost you for being a member of the chamber? Well, it isn't a big deal at all. You go to the you go to the breakfast once in a while, or the the local meeting once a month. I think it's worthwhile, if only for the contacts and the visibility. I'm Bruce for talk. Austin, Texas. Hello there. Well, hello. What hey. a pleasure it is to talk to you. I'm glad you're here, kid. I, I'd like to say that I've been a, a big fan of yours for years, and you've offered me many, many hours of enjoyment listening to you. Well, thank you for saying so. Uh, I have a problem, uh, kind of a problem here I'd like your opinion on. Uh, I'll give you the, the basic facts here. Uh, my father just passed away, leaving my mother in the following situation. She's 75 years old, in very good health. She has 90,000 liquid and will be receiving 1000 a month from Social Security. 1000 Does she get 1000 on her own? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. Where did I get yes, ma'am? Oh, what difference? That's, that's pretty high. Yeah, well, she takes, uh, from what I'm led to believe, uh, she gets what uh, my father's, hers ends, and she takes over my father's. And my father's was, uh, it's 982 a month, actually. I'm surprised to survive. I think that's high. Maybe well, not. this is what Social Security has. Okay, because a thousand isn't a thousand for a single person, which is what your mother is now, Max. Uh, that I couldn't tell you. A sir. month. That I couldn't tell you. Well, whatever. Look, I'm hoping for. Hopefully, your information is accurate. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. Like I said, she has ninety thousand liquid, no debts, and will be uh, receiving uh, nine hundred eighty-two dollars per month. Does she uh, own her own home? Uh, no, sir. They uh, they lived in a, a motor home. They were retired. Is that right? Home. Yeah, and uh, bopping around the country, huh? Oh, they they had a had a wonderful life, and it's a shame my father passed away at sixty three. Sixty three. Uh, yeah, he uh, he got cancer. He loved his motor home, but uh, uh, what that where that leaves my mom is uh, she's going to sell the motor home, and she has uh, about seven thousand dollars of equity in that. Mm -hmm. And her initial plans are just to get an apartment, and I've been trying to talk her into grass buying a mobile home. Why? She, cer she certainly can afford. Well, so she'd have a place uh, that's hers, and uh, I don't think I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't try to talk her into that at all. You know, you think an apartment would be okay? Well, I think it's more than okay. You mentioned your mother's how old? Seventy-five. What in the world? Oh, your your mother, your dad married a, a lady quite older than he. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. The reason I what does your what does your mother need with responsibility for maintenance and all that kind of stuff? Well, I figured a mobile home is relatively low maintenance. Well, what does she need that responsibility for? Serious. Okay, you had valid point. Yeah, valid point. I mean, if she if she wants, you said ownership, let her get a condo. Because there, at least, the maintenance is all done for you. And you have the owner, ownership that, I'm not certain, that's a real smart right now anyway, but. 
Well, that's true. But well, let me ask you this: uh, mm. What would the uh, uh, in Austin, Texas, if you would know, what would the average condo go for? Well, I have it the foggiest notion. Yeah, I was looking at it as a, as a you know, from a monetary standpoint, a mobile home is very, very uh, low. Inexpensive, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that your mother needs that responsibility like she needs a second head. Yeah, okay. Well, she, they, look, your mom and dad indicated that they preferred not having responsibility when they bought the mobile motor home. Yes, sir. Well, why do you want to dig her into a hole? I don't think that makes any sense. Have you asked her? Oh yeah, we we discussed this, but it, she's at the point. This was uh, this has only been three months, and she's still not quite at the point where she exactly knows. Well, in I that think. case, she really don't want to do anything anyway. Yeah, we do. We do want to wait a while, but but uh, which brings me to the the, the point of uh, my call. Mm. Uh, given the fact that you have, uh, let me throw one more into the mix here to help you make a decision. Uh, mm. sh I can foresee my mother living another twenty years easy. Uh, she's mm -hmm. in very very good health for a woman of seventy five. Uh -huh. So, uh, giving all those facts, uh, were she your mother, what what would you do uh, to manage her money? What, what well, would be the best I wouldn't do I wouldn't do very much, tell you the truth. Given the all of the the, the variables you chucked in here, right? Mm -hmm. But let's let's see if we if we're we first of all got to decide where we're going, then we'll look for a road, right? Yes, sir. Which we can we agree on that that approach? Oh yeah. All right, fine. <laughs> well, what we're trying to do is figure out where your mother can be more comfortable. I don't think we want to add to her worries. Okay. She has a relatively modest nest egg. Are all of those factors, is that all very true? Um, question there. Uh, What's you, the question? Would you, would you consider a person of 75 uh, with uh, 90,000 cash uh, and no debts, is that, is that considered modest? I consider it very modest, yes. Do you? Yes, okay. I do. Okay. Well, this is why I'm calling. Okay. <laughs> so what... Uh, what I would do is put that money into something like long-term treasuries that are right now are kicking off 7.5% or something on that order with absolutely no risk whatsoever. That's something my sister had mentioned. Now, what percentage would you say to do? Uh, I'd put it all in. Put it all in. No, I might keep a few dollars, a couple thousand dollars for, for, for crazy money. Mm -hmm. But this would give her her Social Security, which is, you said, $1,000 a month. That's 12000 and round numbers about sixty. I call it six in interest. It's eighteen thousand. She could live very comfortably with no worries. Treasury notes no. would, bills. would yield her. Her treasury or, bills would yield her six percent. Well, the long term. No, I'm sorry. The long term bonds are about seven percent right now. The fraction. I see. Now, okay. is that is that is that the best investment for most of us? No, but you see. At 75 years old, why would you want to put your mom in a position where uh, there's a possibility, or never mind the possibility, that she's got to worry if her nest egg is eroding while she's sleeping? Exactly. Well, exactly. That's, yeah. why, I, that's why I'm picking the Treasury as a very safe investment. Yeah, I'm, now, 40, I'm 43. I'm sure you would suggest different investments, but I understand your point. Without any question. You're absolutely right. And then it goes a little further. Uh, you might... If you want to be a little more sophisticated, you want to you could buy the you could buy a mix of bonds and bills and notes. But you're talking about a, I, I know you don't like to hear this, but it's a very modest amount of money, and all that maneuvering is not going to make a whole lot of difference for why for I'm sitting. I see. What she wants is is I think income without any risk. I see. And what I have suggested to you provides income with no risk. Okay. And as to buying a mobile home, I think that's nonsense. Unless that's something she really wants to do, then go ahead. Mm -hmm. But 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 that's not what you're telling me. Yeah. You're well, telling like me say, that they wanted to be mobile, they wanted to be footloose and carefree, and that's great. But you're saying also, if my dad's not in the picture, and that's true. But it seems to me I wouldn't, I wouldn't tire down with ownership and the responsibility of a little grass patch and the rest of that. If the roof leaks or the plumbing breaks down. She's got to take care of it. Right. Or right. maybe you got to take care of it. <laughs> Probably me. I wish but, you well, uh, kid. Well, I appreciate your help, sir. Have a very happy holiday. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Dad. <laughs> Let's go to Danny Rudd's former hometown.
West New York, New Jersey. Hello there. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Doug. Good morning? Good morning Bruce. Let me check my clock here. Good hey, morning. I'm a little behind the clock. Well, myself. it's okay. It's good morning in Hong Kong. It's all right. Good morning. Uh, good evening, Bruce. It's an honor to talk to you. I, I try to listen to you whenever I get a chance. Uh, <clears throat> maybe you can help me. Uh, my, my sister and I, uh, back in the 70s, the early 70s, bought, my sister worked for a major oil company uh, from 1970 to 75. And at that time, we, we chipped in. I didn't work at that company. I worked in another affiliate here in Jersey. But uh, we went in and bought uh, some property in Tomball, Texas. In where? Tomball, Texas. <laughs> where in the world 50, is... I was 50 miles north of Houston. And uh, we bought an acre. It's an acre and a half of property. And uh, in, the, in over the years, uh, Bruce has done absolutely nothing but... We're paying the taxes on it. <laughs> Laid there quietly waiting, huh? Yeah. Uh, at the time, you know, with the oil boom and everything, it, we, you know, the guy thought, oh, it was going to really explode. There's been a couple of houses built around it. And, uh, hasn't really developed, though. But we're getting, we're starting to get really socked with the taxes, which we pay uh, four times a year. And my, my question is, how do we get out of, I mean, we want to sell it, but we're here in New Jersey. And, like, how do you do that? Well, first of all, is uh, I hate to ask the, the obvious, but it, uh, is this, does it have any value? Well, we paid, my sister and I each paid into this property yeah. $2,500. Uh, my question stands, does it have any value, or do you know? Uh, I really don't know offhand. How did you happen to select a piece of property in t Texas, and you're sitting in New Jersey? Yeah, well, my sister worked for a major company down there in the early 70s, like I said. And she was and, there on site? Yeah, she was there on site, and she, I don't know how it developed, because it was like, it's been over 20, 25 years now. Well, the first thing you can do is make a phone call or two yeah. to the Real Estate or Realtors Association, the yeah. Board of Realtors in that part of the world. Real, okay. Get and, hold get get hold of a real estate agent down there and tell them what you got and say yeah. look we we're interested in in, in having a, an appraisal which you're going to pay for yeah how much does that cost per uh, a couple hundred bucks maybe, maybe right. 100 and 100 and a half yeah the reason i say what you pay for as opposed to a freebie you know you could set yourself up with a freebie i don't want to get me any into that anymore in my house yeah and then you're going to you're going to make you make a decision hopefully from position of strength yeah, because we've, we've had, like, over the years, uh, people that have, you know, in the lumber industry, and they've called my sister up, and they've called me up and said, hey, we'll give you $100 a month, the, the, you know, the wood on your land. Well, that's, no, wait a minute, that's, there's nothing, that's nothing, un, nothing uncommon about that. In Texas, they, the, uh, both the soft and the hardwood, particularly the uh, softwood, can be sold off. Yeah, but well, very hard, though, because we're in one state. You know what I'm saying? Uh, no, I understand what you're saying, and that's why I very rarely tell people, or I will tell people more often, you're very foolish if you buy property that's outside your area. In another state. Because, well, if you were in, in New Jersey and you bought one in New York, well, you're in West New Jersey, or New York, New Jersey. You're right leaving, on the Hudson River, Bruce. You, you, I know exactly. Bergen Line Avenue. Uh, well, uh, well, I know where Bergen, Bergen Line Avenue is the main drag. Uh, <laughs> that's the main drag, but I'm on Boulevard East, and I think... I know where Boulevard East is exactly. My point that I'm trying to make is where yeah. you are, you can see New York. Yes. So it wouldn't matter if you bought something in New York. Right. But you can't see Texas no matter how hard you yeah, look. Yeah, this was 25 years ago. What difference does it make? You couldn't see it then either. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> the bottom line is, how did we get rid of this and get our, and not take a loss? Whoa, 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 whoa. That's Come another. On. That's another. You may take a tremendous loss. You may take a complete loss. Come on. What do you mean, come on? Come I don't know what it's worth. You may have been yeah. swindled by, not, you may have been, uh, a very sharp Texan might have unloaded that property. I yeah. don't know that. Yeah. You got to find out what it's worth. Yeah. You find out what it's worth by getting it appraised, and then we you just find. Had, we just had an acre and a half in a, a whole area of undeveloped doesn't, doesn't, land. It doesn't. What I'm trying to do, you got to get appraised. Get it appraised. Yeah. And then okay. you can talk to to somebody on site down there and see if there isn't in fact any market whatever that may be a hot piece of property i don't know yeah and then get it it may be a piece of property that you couldn't give away with a gun yeah i don't know that either so what i should do is like call up the realtors down there and yes uh, 
because we I don't have all the information on hand, but I you call up with a lot and block number. You tell them your credit card. You tell them you want to get an appraisal. Yeah. Then you can go from there, and you want to find out if if the property is saleable, is there a market, and so forth. What utilities are available, and so on and so forth. Yeah, because uh, we're really starting to get hit with the taxes. Well, I understand. Up every I, year. I, I got the picture, but yeah. that's what you have to. Maybe you may have to get an airplane before it's over. Yeah, <laughs> and Houston is not that far from West New York. I think so. Continental runs flights down there every day. <laughs> well, you know where that is, that area. Well, I know where Houston is. I go there regularly. Yeah, and this I, is north of it. Well, fifty, fifty miles. Yeah. Get in the car. Yeah. And yeah. you don't have to have a passport. Yeah. You can go down for a weekend. But I should call the realtor people up and get an assessment and see what's no, going on. No, not an assessment, an appraisal. Get an appraisal. If you ask for an assessment, you can get something altogether different. Yeah. So get an appraisal and yeah. then, uh, take well, a... Well, you know, I keep telling you guys, how old are you? I'm 45. Well, are you afraid to get on airplanes? No, no well, way. Why don't you fly down and take a look? Take a look at it. It costs you two and a half, three hundred bucks. Yeah, then just take a look and see what's going and on. And talk to people down there and talk to the real estate uh, uh, yeah. salespeople. And what you were saying, it's very hard when you when you start going out of state, right? No, what I'm telling you is that I go, I own property in Texas and, and I own property in New Jersey. Yeah. But I'm not rem, I'm not uh, unamenable to getting on an airplane and looking yeah. at either one of them. You have to get in there and see what's going exactly on. Exactly so. It's a very small country, Tiger. You can be in um, from where you are on the west coast of the, in five hours and twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah. A, I mean, it's that's, not a big deal. That's that's uh, that's that's. You make a very good point, Bruce. I wish you well, kid. I love you and keep up the good work and have a good Christmas. Ah, uh, Merry Christmas to you and to yours. I'm Bruce Williams. Let's take a little time out. And we'll get back together again. This is Talknet. We go to Rutland, Vermont. Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Well, good evening. Uh, Long-time listener, first-time caller. Well, thank you very much for your interest. What's on your mind? Well, I'm, I'm going to be taking a trip out of the country, and I have uh, two questions related to credit cards. I've heard you talk before about travel and leisure cards versus... Yeah, where uh, are you going? Uh, we're going to New Zealand. Oh, my goodness. My daughter went there this spring. Yeah, yeah, first time to New Zealand, and uh -huh. uh, the the interesting thing is that the, the first time this came up was, I'd listened to you before, and I, I'm afraid I can't remember what your advice was other than to use travel and leisure cards, and I wasn't sure why. The first first well, time it came up... Well, wait, I'm not sure I said use travel and leisure. Oh, I know what I said. When, when you were... If you rent an automobile... Right. Use your an American Express card. Right. The catch, because, of course, is that... Uh, because just, the... Collision damage waiver is primary with American Express overseas. Except in New Zealand. It's not primary in New Zealand? It says uh, uh, their information says that uh, the card member uses the card to charge and pay for a car rental from any commercial car rental company other than those located in Italy and New Zealand. Is that right? <laughs> well, you taught me something. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's in there. I wonder why that is. Well, I, I don't know, and I haven't called to find out. I assume that um, New Zealand seems to have a way of uh, ensuring that you spend as much money in the country as possible, and they do have provision for uh, American citizens to rent uh, automobile, lease automobiles short-term and buy insurance while well, you're there. Big deal. I mean, but how much? Um, it's about $110 a month. From for the a, insurance? For, for, yes, for a company that leases you uh, the, uh, a guaranteed buyback program in Auckland, which we've uh, found out about through our trial. Wait, but they, they lease you the car and then you, they buy it back? They guarantee a buyback with, with a depreciation built in. How long are you going to be there? Three months. Is that the least expensive way to go? Uh, it's a heck of a lot cheaper than the average price of a of of, re of rental. Absolutely. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that. I, I mean, maybe it may well be. Um, it's considerably cheaper by mm -hmm. as much as twenty bucks a day, which over ninety days. Well, what's it cost to lease the car for the three month period? It, it, it Net really, cost. When you're all done and said, how much? Uh, it it absolutely varies based on what you're going to buy. Well, obviously, if you're going to get a Mercedes, it's not going to be the same as a Yugo. But, <laughs> but a, and a, and what, what are you going to get? A mid-sized car or a, a mid-sized station wagon? I guess. All right. Now, what is it going to cost you? Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure of the absolute dollar amount because I, number one, I, I've, I just got the figures. Number two, I haven't converted them yet to American dollars. But I'm expecting uh, that the net cost is going to be about uh, in the area of twenty-five dollars per day. Seven fifty a month. Mm-hmm. 
That's including insurance and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not cheap by any matter of means. No, it isn't. Uh, and they're they're obviously you don't have to rent it for three months, um, depending on where we're staying. Mm -hmm. um, there are other options, but uh, it's a hell of a vacation for three months. Yeah. Aren't yeah. you going to go to Australia? Uh, no. Why? Just not interested in doing that much travel at this time. I'm much more interested in um, locating in one spot and uh, and getting to know one spot well rather than doing a lot of traveling. We have small children. Boy, I think you're making a huge mistake. Unless you <laughs> unless you have tons and tons and tons of money. Unless we have tons of money. Yeah, uh, because you're going halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. And three months in New Zealand. New Zealand's a love. I have not been there, but I, as I said, my daughter spent six weeks traveling that part of the world here in the in the springtime, their fall. And they talked very nicely about New Zealand, but they also, uh, the Tahiti and Bora Bora, and you can work all that stuff in for a minimal amount of cost. Why would you want to just be in one relatively uh, bucolic area for three whole months? Well, we'll have to work on that. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean I, to, I, be I, so, to be a hop, skip, and a yodel from, from Australia and not take it in, and a couple of the, the Polynesian islands, I think, gee, is this. Unless you figure you're going to get back there next next year or something. Well, I'm I'm not so sure about that. I'm, I'm this is this is probably a once in a lifetime opportunity. So. Well, in that case, uh, how old are your children? Five and two. Well, a two year old is going to remember nothing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just think that you'd be very foolish not to consider Australia, at least a, a couple of major cities in Australia. Mm -hmm. And if it were me, I would want to see. Well, they say Boro Boro is the place to see. I don't know. Not been there. It's the one part of the world I've not visited. Uh, but I'd hit Boro Boro and Tahiti uh, and Australia. I would not hang out for three months anywhere when you're going to hit that part of the world maybe only once in a lifetime. My friends, I hope the good Lord blesses your holidays. From all of us at TalkNet, we wish you everything in life that you wish for yourself. A holy, happy Christmas and a healthy, prosperous New Year. I know it's not easy, but give it your best shot, kid. Just try and do what's right. This is Bruce Williams. A very Merry Christmas. Okay, five on. years. After five years, I I, I I don't know if there's any statutory limitation on that kind of mistake. But as a practical matter, I don't think you have to worry about it. I don't need I, I just wanted to worry. I mean, I did everything I knew to do. Yeah, you did well. You could. You, you might have... Well, you, you did well. A lot of people would have done anything. What you could have done was uh, send them a letter. But clearly, uh, you made an effort. They called you back. I, your answer was a little crafty. Yeah. <laughs> so they obviously knew nothing of it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, no one complained that they had a missing... I don't think it was probably missing. Probably somebody tapped in a payment for you. As contrasted with misapplying somebody else's check. Well, I wish I knew who that was. I'd like to send him a thank you note. I'll bet you would. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you did okay. But But there's no... I mean, chances are no one's going to come back and say That's what. a fair statement. I cannot say they will not. I cannot say they cannot. But I think it's a fair statement they probably will not. Do you think there's a statute of limitations on this? I would suspect that there is, but I don't know that either. Okay. But, I mean, like, like anything else, what, what is the purpose of a statute of limitations? Well, eventually, evidence is lost. Uh, exactly. You no one cares. I mean, <laughs> well, no, no. I don't think that's your, your, your first point was yeah. accurate. Evidence is lost. The ability to prove a point and whatever goes away. Your ability to defend yourself goes away. That's why they have statutory limitations. There are a couple of things uh, that there are none. I believe on murder is one. There is no limitation. Yeah, the murder, probably uh, kidnapping. Or uh, I, 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 IRS fraud is another. But, but I, don't, I don't think I come into that. I think you probably right there like Lily Borden. Lily, what's her name? Lily Borden? Be what was her name? Borden. Bessie Borden? Uh, Lizzie Bessie Borden. Borden. Lizzie Borden had an axe, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think you're going to make your public enemy number one. I do wish you well, guys. Okay, thank you very much, Bruce. Hi, Bruce Williams. Saying in. This is TalkNet. Let's go to Charleston, South Carolina. Hello there. Hello. Hello, baby. How are you? <laughs> Nervous. No, why would you be nervous? Uh, on the a nice guy like me. I uh, don't know. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, I was awarded a beach house and a divorce four year, three years ago, two years ago. 
bought, <laughs> no, let's start again. Well, I got four, the, three, two, one, bang. All right, I bought the beach house four years ago, got the divorce two years ago. Okay. And um, had purchased it for $160,000, and it is today, um, they, the realtor says, worth two hundred and seventy-five. so it's appreciated about $115,000 in four years. Where did you buy this thing? On the beach. And well, the, the beach. <laughs> yeah, the There's beach. a long beach from <laughs> Maine to Florida. Folly Beach. In South Carolina. Uh-huh. And it's gone up from, a, in four years, a hundred and some odd thousand. A hundred and fifteen. Boy, you made 30,000 bucks a year just to own the house, 600 bucks a week. I'm feeling better. Not bad. <laughs> where, do you get the, where, where do you get the capital gains tax? That's what I've called about. Um, I'm a student. and A um, student? How old are you? Now, that's not nice. Well, you're non-traditional. I'm 41. Well, you're a non-traditional right. student. That's cool. Go right. ahead. And, um, and so it's a rental property, and I do break, I break even as far as um, the rental and uh, the people handling it, but when it comes to the taxes it's, um, and the insurance, it's about $3,900 a year, which is hard for me right now. Why don't you sell it? Well, that's what I'm asking about. Is um, It's hard to let go of something that's appreciating like it is. But then... My old man used to say something years ago uh -huh. that maybe applies here. Okay. A fast nickel is better than a slow dime. And what makes you think that house is, I had a beach house that I bought for, you know, a modest amount of money that went to 600000 and it dropped off to three. Mm. What makes you think things can't go down after they go up? Oh, I don't think that they can't. It's well, just they do, and they can do it in a hurry. Particularly real estate can fall like a safe out of an airplane. Mm -hmm. Now, you're telling me you're struggling to hang on to this. Is that correct? Um, yeah, tax time. And How much is your mortgage? It's um, right now. I owe 110. All right. So you had 100. And how much you've been offered for it? Um, well, I haven't been offered anything, but they feel oh. sure yeah. that you know. How much? 75. So it's 165, and you'll probably pay something in the order of um, you get that. You probably get a listing for five percent. Six. You can get it for five percent. Trust me. Okay. You got to negotiate. Okay. Um, you probably walk out of there. What do I just about one hundred and forty thousand dollars? One hundred and forty thousand dollars while you're in school, putting treasuries right now would bring you over ten thousand dollars, or two hundred bucks a week. Okay. Now you will have some. Ca excuse me, that's not. I forget what I just said. Okay. Not not true, because you're going to have um, about twenty five thousand dollars in taxes due here. That's, that's what I was going to ask about. Unless the Republicans do the right thing by us and reduce the capital gains tax. But you see, that's for the wealthy, not for people like you who are divorced and going to school. You're wealthy. You're rich. <laughs> you're filthy, rotten rich, you see. <laughs> you don't feel filthy, rotten rich, do you? I don't feel filthy. No, Very no, few people do. Not last night at 3 o'clock in the morning when I'm going, what? <laughs> well, but the point is, according to the... Of many people among us, you are filthy, rotten, rich, and therefore don't deserve a tax re uh, tax cut. Right. Capital gains would be a smart way to cut, given the fact that hopefully uh, the significant amount of that would it be it would encourage business, and beyond that, would also create business because people would reinvest the money instead of sending it to Washington, where it'll be thrown away and squandered. But right now, it's twenty seven percent. Twenty seven percent on on. Or twenty seven twenty eight. I'm not sure. Right. On the gain. On the gain. Mm -hmm. So th that was my question: Is what you paid for it? Does that go? That's the base. That's the base, and then any capital improvements that you made, right? That gets subtracted. Any depreciation you may took, that gets added on. Mm -hmm. um, so do any you... commissions that you paid for real estate that gets subtracted? Okay. Okay, well... But in your case, I mean, you're a filthy rich lady, so I don't have, I don't feel sorry for you. I'm glad you're paying all these taxes. <laughs> you're going to wind up, instead of the number I figured on, what did I say, 165 or something like that? Mm -hmm. You're going to wind up with probably 140. Let me, let's do the, let's do the numbers again so we're not wrong. Okay. You, you get 275, you think you can get for it. Right. And we're going to have to pay, as I said, about 5%. Let's call it uh, everything in, $15,000. Okay. That's 260. And how much is your mortgage? Um, 110. 150. We got taxes from that number of probably twenty five. You probably run up with a buck and a quarter. Okay.
cash money. Okay. 125 would bring you still $9,000 a year or close to $9,000 a year. And instead of having to send checks out whenever you, you went with a positive nine a year, and maybe as important, you don't have to worry about it right now. You're going to help. And where are you? What, what are you studying and how far along are you? Nursing. I have one year. All right, this way, you have nothing to worry about. I like I think, to not worry. Before. Right, well, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. It does. All right, Nurse Nancy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for your call. Okay, from Charleston, a success story to Dayton, Ohio, W-H-I-O country. Hello there. How are you doing, Bruce? Oh, I'm doing real well, thank you. Uh, happy holidays to you. And to you and yours. I uh, listen to you every night faithfully on W-H-I-O. I really get a lot out of your show. Well, thank you. The reason I'm calling, uh, I purchased a used automobile in March of 1994. All right. And can, you, can I ask how used? It was an 87. Okay. And uh, I, uh, I've been driving it, and I've had some problems with it, and I just had to have the engine replaced in it now. That's a major problem. Yeah. During, this, uh, during this time, uh, actually after the, first, the week I had the car, uh, some problems developed, and the, the dealership took care of it. I did buy it, buy it from a dealer. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, uh, during the process of uh, getting this engine replaced, I found out that the original owner that traded the car in had blown the engine yeah. and it only had like 75,000 miles on it. And I was sort of thinking like, well, if I would have known this before, I wouldn't have bought the car because... Well, wait, if he blew it, it had to be repaired. Well, I understand. I understand. But what, I, what I'm saying is, is if the engine was blown, you knew that you'd have to know that they didn't take care of it as well as they should have. What else is going to go wrong? Uh, well, I suppose that is a, that's a conclusion you could reach, but I don't know if it's one that can be supported. Okay. Well, well when, you know, look, look at this. Suppose for this. Let's extend that for a moment, okay? Okay. Guy's riding down a road, takes care of his car, changes the oil every 2,500 miles, everything right. Mm -hmm. He blows a radiator hose. Right. Engine... It's overheated in a hurry. Maybe the idiot light doesn't work that day. Maybe he doesn't notice. Only take a maybe a few minutes and the engine goes. Right. Could happen. Well, to, to maybe lend some, some support to that was that the week after I bought it, I had to have the starter replaced and the mm -hmm. alternator replaced. Mm -hmm. And then two yeah, weeks before the pretty hard to abuse those. The starter you can abuse. How do you abuse an alternator? I, it needed to be replaced. Yes, but you, I'm talking about a. You can't. It's not because somebody did something just wrong. Wear out. Car. They just wear out. Okay. Starter theoretically you can abuse, although really most people. Right. I also know. had the timing belt replaced, which I know goes out, but yeah. I also had to have the pulleys replaced, which I've well, never heard of. Well, well, I think maybe they, <laughs> they may be. Well, I can't tell you that, <laughs> but <laughs> you can't abuse a timing right. belt or chain either. At any rate, um, I had the engine went out, and I talked to them. They said it's really not worth rebuilding. We uh, we just want to put a new one in, and I kind of felt like, well, I've only had the car for about eight months. That this is something that maybe you guys should cover. Now they were gracious mm -hmm. enough to uh, uh, go half, where they paid for the engine, I paid for labor. I got stuck with like an eight hundred, nine hundred dollar labor fee. Well, the labor was very high, and I just was wondering if I have any recourse at I don't all. Think, I don't, unless you had some kind of a warranty. Right, I didn't ha I didn't have a warranty. I don't think they, they had any obligation to do anything for you. Okay. Nothing, whatever. Well, I, that's what I wanted to know, Bruce. Uh, the eight months later on an older car? Right. No, I don't think they did you any great favors either because the time they get done packing the labor bill, majority of that, of that engine charge was right that labor side. What was interesting was uh, they told me that when when they get a car and it has a blown engine, that they get an engine from like a junkyard, yeah. and they don't take it apart. They just look look it over, yeah. and if it looks somewhat clean, they stick it in the car. Well, they and whatever they, happens, happens. They probably do a little more than just look it over. I wouldn't be surprised if they do a compression test. Just get it, uh, get it hooked up where you can do a compression, you know, turn the engine over right. and do a compression test. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. So I should consider myself lucky that they paid for the engine and I just had Well, to you gotta, you gotta, if you got a, a, a completely rebuilt engine for 800 bucks, not a bad price. Well, this was another engine out of a wrecked car. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. We built it. When you buy a rebuilt starter, 
they've taken a, a burned out starter out of one guy who got a trade in and rebuild it. Nothing unusual about that. Our telephone number 800 743 800 I would like to hear from you. I would indeed. I'm Bruce. This is Talk Cat. Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining me, Guy. I only wish I would have uh, been turn- tuning into you about a year, year half ago. I, I, I was back in, uh, I was uh, very naive about investment. Now I'm, I'm a little bit more enlightened on the subject. But what, what happened? Uh, well, what happened was I, I um, did a summer job and I, I made a substantial amount of money, about fifteen thousand dollars. In the summer? Yeah, I'm a student and I work um, primarily in the summer. What did you do in the summer to make yourself fifteen big ones? S- uh, sold books door to door, Tom Smell. Did you really? Mm-hmm. You must be one hell of a salesman. Well, I, well, I try. I, I did it. I did it this year, and I only worked four weeks and made um, nine thousand. But um, wow, <laughs> it's, it's I'm, about, I'm impressed. It's about a forty percent. Uh, pro- I mean, you know, profit. Um, they take sixty, you take forty, so it's uh, the unit price is about fifty nine dollars. But anyway, I, I had some extra money to uh, to invest, and I, I heard from a friend that. Um, that a guy that he knew was was going to be running a um, a haunted house, and that he would be giving about thirty percent um, return um, on that. And so what I did was I gave. We're running a haunted house. What for? Where for? Well, he had he was he was uh, going to be just just a haunted house, you know, like they do. Um, and just no, just, I, I really don't know. That's why I'm asking. Oh, have you, you never been to like a haunted house at the mall or something like that? At a mall? No, I've seen temporary ones for Halloween. Yeah, well, yeah, I've, that's, I've, that's, that's seen, what it was. Just, I've seen the ones in, in, in amusement parks. I just want to narrow it down. That's all. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Just a, just a temporary one for Halloween is what it was. So mm-hmm. the investment was to be like yeah, I invested in um, uh, last September. Um, and it was to be given as the, the promissory note was to mature on, um, in November and uh, well, around the first of November. Anyway, the, the haunted house flopped, um, because they didn't have a good location, poor advertising, whatnot. And I've, I mean, I've been stuck with a promissory note and no way to collect it. And I'm trying to, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how I've tried everything. I've tried, you know, um, you know, just, I mean, he, to the point of almost threatening the guy, trying to get the money back. Well, does he have it? No. <laughs> well, you're not going to get it then. There's, there's nothing I can do. No, that's what it was. Not. How much were you supposed to get? You gave him how much? and you I back? gave him thirty five fifty. Yeah. And he's given me um, 4500 back. He's supposed to give you. Oh, he's supposed to, yeah. Well, uh, wait a minute. Take a deep breath. What's your first name? John. That's $1,000 mm-hmm. in two months, round mm-hmm. numbers. If you, if it worked out, right? Mm-hmm. That's six thousand dollars a year on a thirty five hundred dollar investment. Mm-hmm. Well, that's extraordinarily high return, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, that's why the risk was just as high, and the risk came in. You lost. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, there's there's another. I mean, there's a there's a one way of of uh, going about it. I, it's kind of a twist to it. I, I wrote the, the check out. I wrote two checks out to, um, not to him, but to his wife. And see, see, basically, I mean, I was so naive. I, I should have gotten collateral or something like that. But, um, but see, I wrote the check out to her because he didn't, she, he didn't have a checking account at the time. Um, but see, anyway, she, he, she's got the money. She's got all the, the house in her name, the, the car, a clear title in her name. Why is everything in her name? Because he basically, I didn't know at the time. Forget I mean, the basically. Why his, did he? His credit, his credit is not good at all. His credit stinko. Yeah, exactly. So you know, he's got several collectors after him. But the money went to her. The the money went to her. Now her checking it, account. The, no, the check was written to her. Exactly. In that case, you can go after her. I can. Yes, sir. Because that's what I wanted. I I I um, I'm thinking well, about your position. Well, oh, let's take a deep breath. Okay. Yeah. Your position is I learned her. I loaned her the money. Uh huh. That's all. But I don't have a promissory note on her. On I have one on him. Well, you do have a check. Mm-hmm. It shows the money went to her. Okay. Promissory note to him is worthless. Okay. But the you can, your position would be I don't know how far you get with that. You're sure. not getting you're not getting anything out of him. But understand something. Mm-hmm. You took a long shot, kid. Yeah. 
you're going to get the, the, the when any, well, let me ask why would anybody who is wor worth anything at all in the world be willing to pay you that kind of money I, I know now because they can't get it from anywhere else <laughs> well of course I mean that's you know you're, you're talking about I forget what that would work out to uh, in I don't know what the percentage would be I have to do with my but certainly well over a hundred percent hundred and fifty percent hundred some of that order who in the world pays that kind of, you know right now treasuries are treasuries 30 year paying seven percent mm -hmm. well I understand you too that's why venture capitalists get such high interest yeah because they lose more than they win yeah well you just lost I figured I've I've learned a lot though I haven't lost everything you know I understand I've, I've learned a lot about investment and you know I, I never loan anybody you know anything again unless I've got something to back it up you know well, I think that's fair but you see when people loan money that is uncollateralized they get higher interest rates mm -hmm. and higher losses mm -hmm. I do wish you well guy it's an expensive lesson hopefully hopefully you can afford the tuition Ann Arbor hello there Bruce hey how you doing. Well, um, uh, I wish you, I hope you and your family had a, a Merry Christmas. It was a very, very, very wonderful holiday, yes. Well, for us, too. Uh, I am um, in a quandary. I've been thinking about this, was talking this over with my wife for, uh, it seemed like eons. Uh, I am uh, uh, four years from 62 years old uh, where I could get my Social Security. Mm hmm and I uh, have 31 years in the Teamsters. I'm a Teamster, been driving on the road for 43 years, mm -hmm. and uh, am considering uh, taking an early retirement uh, in uh, at the end of '95, possibly, as to where I would uh, I wouldn't be able to get all my pension out, uh, but I would get it all, but about 300 a month. Uh, you know, it would be about 300 less a month than what I would if I would stay until I got well, to wait like 62. A, wait a minute, wait a minute. How much is your pension? Well, how much would you get if you stayed till you're 62? 3,000. 3,000 what? A month. For life? Yeah. And if you get out before, you get 2,700 a month. Yeah, for every, uh, for every year that you stay after you get your 30 years in, uh, you get another $100 uh, up to $3,000. Now that's max. Yeah. But if you start collecting early, what then? Well, you would get the 2700 for the rest of your life. But you're, you're going to start collecting early, is that correct? That's what I was considering. Well, let's, let's do the arithmetic. You want to you want to quit at 60, is that correct? Yeah, or 59. Well, which? There's a big difference. Well, it's $100 difference. No, there's a lot more than that difference. Well, uh, in, in the pension, it would be $100 difference. Yeah, but we don't know for how many years, do we? Well, for for life. Well, how how long are you planning on living? And then we can tell, we can figure this out. Well, uh, that's the problem. We then we don't. Ninety, bros. Well, that's nice if it works out that way. If if you live to be ninety, then you shouldn't quit. Yeah. You uh, see what I'm saying? Well, I'm getting what I, what I'm getting at is I'm awful tired of. Uh, All right, that isn't the issue. I'm, I don't have no I have no problem with that. What I'm trying to tell you is that. Let's assume that you go to 60 for the sake of this. You got you to assume something, right? Right. So you're going to give up 200 bucks a month. Is that correct? Right, right. But on the other hand, you're going to collect 2,800 bucks a month or 28,000, uh, 32, 33,8 yeah. times two is 66, uh, eight, 16, 67, six extra, right? Uh-huh. All right, so you got to figure out how much you'd lose a month. And I think it was something like uh, $2,400. Right? Yeah, you lose two hundred dollars a month. Well, wow, that's twenty four. That's twenty eight hundred dollars a year, right? Right. Ten years, twenty eight thousand. Twenty years, fifty six thousand, and so forth. The line's going to cross when you're about eighty. I think that I, I, you better check those numbers too uh, to be certain they're accurate. Well, I've got the paperwork okay. in my hand. It just sounds to me like that that they'll be a little generous. Well, uh, no, this is uh, this is what. Uh, Look, I'm not. Down. I don't want to argue. Yeah. If that's what it says, yeah. terrific. But check the numbers to be. What happens if somebody screwed up on that quote paper, and you make a decision, you find out. Well, well, that's through that. I understand that fully, Bruce. I'm. That's the reason why I'm. Uh, that's the reason why I'm doing my homework. Right. Because it sounds to me like it's pretty damn generous. Yeah, it only, is. Only giving up two hundred bucks and getting two extra years. 
See, I've, think, I've got my 30 years in. I don't care about the 30 years. Well, well, 30 year is the is the. Uh, I understand know. that. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is, the penalty is very small. Yeah. I think inordinately small. It's going to take them a long, long time to catch up. Mm -hmm. You would be in your 80s, and statistically, you're not going to live into your 80s. Yeah. So you're ahead of the game getting out early. Well, this is what everybody's been telling me. It's, uh, you know, if you can get it out, if you can get out, get out. And, uh, well, I'm not what saying I was that's what doing was getting, uh, you know, if, even a part-time job. Just How much do you earn a year? 50, 52. No, but you see, let's assume that you work till 60, right? Yeah. You're only working for 20. Yeah. You see, why did I say that? Back up again. Right now, how much could, if you got out right now, how much could you get out for? Uh, well, uh, 2100 right now, but there's the... Uh, how did it get to be 2100 Well... You said $100 a year. Right, I don't, you're right, only 2600 uh, March of, or I mean June of 95, we're, to, we're supposed to get a $500 increase. Well, you don't know that yet. No, it's not. It's not finalized yet. But no, this is the word. This is what's coming down the grapevine. Well, I don't trust it. But the point I'm trying to get to is that right now. How much could if you get out right now? How much could you get? Twenty one hundred. Then you're only you're only making thirty thousand a year right now. I'm making well, yeah, yeah. I see where you're going. Because twenty thousand you get if you don't do a tap. Right. Well, that number gets high enough, then it's just ridiculous working. Yeah. I do wish you well, guy. Well, I um, uh, and uh, I appreciate your time. It's been a joy. I, I like understand for thirty years why you're tired. Not, that's not hard to understand. I'm Bruce Williams. This is tough. Man. Eureka, California. You go in Brian's hometown. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. Hi. Hey, Merry Christmas to you. Well, thank you and to you and yours. Okay. Hey, um, listen. Uh, I'm going to start a, a little manufacturing business up here. A, a woodworking type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about uh, high-end uh, uh, little boxes for offices and what, little what like, things what, you sell in gift shops. And uh, oh, take a deep breath. What yeah. kind of what kind of little boxes? Uh, in and out boxes, uh, baseball card boxes. Uh, uh, I can make briefcases. I can make a lot of different things out of wood. It's, it's not so much it's not so much the uh, product I'm focusing on. It's the business that I'm focusing on. I've always wanted to start a little business, and I can make almost anything out of out of wood and plastic. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's I, I've been working for these guys uh, who make point of purchase displays for for three years up here. Sure. Uh, for you know, for jewelry companies, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, w the problem I have. Is my credit is bad? I've got uh, I've got a student loan that that I still owe on, and I've, I've probably uh, got a total of say seventy five hundred bucks that on my TRW that I'm that I'm uh, down on. You're doing well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got I, I've been talking to uh, you know what a small town this is uh, you know around here. I've been here. to Eureka many times. Eureka, yeah, exactly. I've got. Uh, I've got bank loan officers that are my friends here who want to talk to me about uh, about getting myself going here, and and I told them, hey, listen, if I come in with uh, with a business plan and with uh, investors, I, I've got investors lined up. If I come in with uh, you know a couple of guys who want to give me whatever 500 bucks each, well, that's not exactly very much money. I know, but it'll buy me a couple of machines to, to well, start. Well, I mean, when you say investors, that kind of uh, imply some money and five hundred dollars. I understand when you have no money is money. Yeah. But it doesn't. It's not going to impress. If, if the banker sticks his, how much do money do you want? Let's do it that way. What I what I want to do is is go in uh, to a bank loan officer and say, hey, what I've got, I'm this much in debt. Is there a way that that I can get this much money, say seventy five hundred, ten thousand dollars, and wipe out my debt? And uh, uh, that way, I could just start up a you know brand new credit. Not gonna happen. With uh, it is not going to happen. How about if I have orders from companies? It's not going to happen. Really? Not for a small operation. He'd be sticking his neck out and losing his job if you 
Oh, that kind of, I mean, if, if I were on the board, mm-hmm. I would can a guy that loaned the money like that. <laughs> now, he wants to loan you the money personally. That's okay. Uh-huh. But that's the kind of thing. It's not a question of discrimination or that kind. But that's the kind of stuff where the FDIC would, would go crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, like money, the money that you need is going to have to come from people who love you. Private, yeah. Uh-huh. Your mother, your father, your aunt, your uncle, that kind of stuff. All right, all right. That's what I was trying not to do. Well, why? Because they don't have it. Well, if they don't have it, then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> if, if they don't have it... If they, they can't lend you that that they don't have. If you say you don't want them to loan it to you because you don't put them in jeopardy, that's a different matter. That's the, yeah, yeah. Well, if you don't put them in jeopardy, why would you want to put the bank in jeopardy? Uh, the bank, the banker was uh, was uh, uh, pretty positive about it. Well, maybe you would be. He went, you know, he wanted to give the money to me. It seemed like to me. But you done, But he hasn't given you any yet, has he? I haven't. I haven't put together my package yet for him. My okay, question, hope my question was, what else? What else besides besides orders and a business plan and a and a uh, and investors and and uh, like I said, wrapping wrapping up the whole package for him? What, well, what not else a not a whole do? lot more. It's just that what you're looking for, by any definition that I know, is venture capital. Mm-hmm. Banks mm-hmm. are not supposed to be venture capitalists. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is not supposed to. It's it's not responsible. That's right. Venture capital. You, did you hear the guy of, a few minutes ago who was talking about where he, he loaned them thirty five hundred and was supposed to get back? Uh, what the, was it? Forty five hundred in two months. I I listen to you all the time. I I miss that though okay. because we're on tape. Here. Okay. Well, that was on the telephone. You might have been holding on. Yeah, exactly. The point that I'm trying to raise is that when people uh, pay that kind of interest is because they're shaky and they usually fail. Right. That's why venture capitalists get such high ta- high tariffs. The money for, a, for an operation like you're talking from, generally speaking, has to come from somebody who loves you. I do wish you well, Guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Dead. We go now to Malone, New York, to say hello. Hello? Hello there. How are you doing? Okay. Sure. Uh, I wanted to ask you a few questions on what your opinion would be on how to recover from a bankruptcy. When you say recover, could you be more specific? Well, about uh, in 91, I had to file a bankruptcy. Chapter what? Chapter 7. Personal? Personal. Okay. Why did you have to do this? Well, I was... You're hot, I know, but how? what happened? Well, I was... Uh, how can I say this? Somebody kind of lied to me. Let's put it this way. Uh, when I met my wife, that was my girlfriend at the time, we had a kid. And she was on social services. Okay? They agreed that I would not have to pay the, ba- the confinement cost for the hospital bill as long as I kept medical coverage on the boy. Well, one year out of the blue... They uh, came along and said that uh, they were going to take my income tax return, you know, to pay this bill. Well, I always use my income tax and stuff to pay off my taxes on my home and, you know, stuff like that. Like How much state. did you, I right, only got a minute. How much did you discharge with the bankruptcy? How much did you owe? Oh, uh, it was about 15000 mm-hmm. I owed a credit card and a personal loan. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I wish I would have probably wouldn't have did it now. At yeah. the time, I couldn't have, I didn't seem to see any other way out of it, you know, to get help from under, to do it, you know what I'm saying? To get, I understand. you know, it just seemed like the right thing to do. Well, uh, the easy thing to do, certainly. What, that? It was the easy thing to do, certainly. Well, I guess you could say that, yeah, yeah. it probably was. You well, know? I understand that. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering, what can you do to help get your credit back, or is there well, any? It takes time. It takes time. Do you have a Do you have a credit card? Yes, I got two of them. All right, then that's a step. Okay. Uh, have you borrowed money for a car or anything like that? Uh, no, I can't do that. None Why? of the bank. None of the banks will talk to me on that. Well, when you say you have a credit card, how did you manage that? Did you do? Well, it? the lawyer that handled the case for me told me I would have one six months after I uh, after the bankruptcy, probably. Uh-huh. They'll be right after you to get one because he says they know you can't file bankruptcy again for seven well, years. Well, that, that, that's also true. 
It's just a very slow process. You keep applying from time to time for other types of loans. And if you've demonstrated that you're now a solid citizen, you have a decent income, it'll work its way out. It takes a little while, but it takes a long while. But there's little you can do about that now. I do wish you well, kid. I am Bruce Williams. This is Talk Debt. Yeah, now, what do you do for a living? I'm a business consultant. No, I'd have gone to work every. Wouldn't have bothered me the slightest. But go ahead. Okay, so what happened was that, you know, the transaction closed. And And you moved. uh, Pardon me? Did you move? Yes, we moved. Oh, okay. And uh, the the owner um, had to provide, or the seller at this time, had to provide an additional $25,000. To make it uh, closing to, to close the transaction because it was short to pay off taxes and homeowners association. Yeah, they had to go to the closing with a check. That's tough. Right, right? which probably included my 1500 if you know. I don't think so. Technically, you could argue, I guess, argue that point. That is the issue. I know, I know what they're talking about, but that doesn't make you feel in the slightest bit better. Oh, no, you, no, it doesn't, doesn't, no, I'm not saying that. Yeah, that they, just, they went to the closing with a check. A lot of people do it these days. Right, right. So actually, then I was informed to, to back up a step when I when I finally did get a hold of the owner seller uh, within two weeks of closing the transaction. She had informed me that she did not have my security deposit and would not be able to pay it back to me mm-hmm. uh, ex- without an extension of time. Mm-hmm. So my what, question what, what is this: What choice did you have at that point? Pardon me. What choice did you have at that point? The only choice I guess that I saw having was one. I could have stayed in the apartment, in the condominium, and refused to have moved out. No, you, but you elected not to do that. Right, or the other thing is to take her to small claims court. What good is that? It's not any good because Absolutely. she's out of state. And Beside that, what good is it? If they don't have the money, what good is it? Right. That, that's basically what... I mean, I was left extending credit to an insolvent individual. Absolutely. Right. And my question, I guess, is, you know, I'm not... I, I can sympathize with the woman who's having the financial troubles, or at least empathize with the oh. woman who's having the financial troubles. And mm-hmm. uh, she, you know, she had been hurt badly by, of the, course. by, the, by the, the real the, estate the, values in California. Yep. You know? That's life. Right. My question is, though, I was dealing with uh, two real estate agents who were probably 20 years plus experience, and they were, were working for established agencies in the area. Well, like a, they, they are representing their client. So there's, not, there's not no they, obligation they didn't, they didn't on represent their part. you. Pardon me? They didn't represent you. They represented that's, that's their client. That's true. That's true. So I guess basically they acted within their rights on the transaction. I would think so. Was there, is there anything ethically that, that... Well, first of all, you said two agencies. You mean the ones who were on the selling side? Well, actually one, well, I guess, the, technically the, represented the buyer. I don't think so. But no. I mean, all, don't all agents have to represent a seller? So I, that's correct. Right, unless so. they're specifically buyer's agents. I don't want to get into the agency about the laws of agency where they right. do have some responsibility. They had none to you. Right. They were. They had no responsibility to you in terms of the sale transaction. Mm-hmm. Now, the guy that was the rental agent is it may be a little different matter. <clears throat> if he could be, if it could be demonstrated, I don't know how you do this, that he knew that. He was accepting money you'd never see again and so forth. Maybe, but I don't think so. That'd be the very o- difficult. Yeah. Yeah, the only move that you had was as soon as that person said to you, you won't get your money, stop and payment on that check. Because you were a good guy, you were paying on time and so forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should have got That would have got you a grand. That's true. The 500 you will never see. I don't think you're going to see this 1500 either. So there's never so there's no real recourse toward the agents and because so. you're looking in, for in you're looking for of the of the seller I have received she has made some payments back to me. Uh-huh. Well, you 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 were looking for deeper pockets and I don't see any in, in sight. That's what it comes down to. I, I really wasn't. I'm not really looking for any monetary uh, well, you know, recourse. I'm looking for. I was concerned more about the ethical. You know, well, what did they family. do that was unethical? Well, they knew that my liability existed as a claim. But that's not. But that's not their problem. That's true. Their problem is to represent. They, their look. What is the? What, let's let's very quickly. The function of a broker is to bring a willing buyer, willing seller, two people together. Whatever they're gonna, whatever their relationship will be. Uh-huh. They did that. They did that. Now it's customary to collect uh, on a either a month or a month and a half, depending on the jurisdiction, security and rent and all that kind of good stuff mm-hmm. ahead of time. They did that. It's also customary to give that money to their client, less whatever commissions they've earned. They did that. Mm-hmm. What did they do wrong? No, not, nothing. I guess that's what I'm saying. I think they probably acted within their rights. Well, what did they do wrong? I mean, forget about their rights. What did they do wrong in that scenario? Well, I mean, they, whoever whoever structured the closing transaction and... Well, no, the closing is a different matter. 
Well, the, what I'm but those is, those agents have no responsibility, no relationship with you. Okay, my argument is is that you you could argue that my security deposit was used, was used as a funding. Well, you could also be able to close a transaction. You, you could argue that they shouldn't have paid the utility bills either, or whatever. Yeah, that's true. But they had a lien of some kind, and it was up to you to get one. So right? your position is that there's nothing really at fault on the, on the on the part of the agent. I don't see where the agents did anything wrong. That's right. Okay. I really don't. Okay. I can I can I can I can empathize using your term. It's a good one, with mm -hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, and oftentimes in these circumstances, somebody gets burned, and you were the good guy and got burned. That's true. I do wish you well, my friend. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk That. We go down to Durham, North Carolina. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Hi. How are you? I am just fine, thank you. Great. I have a 19-year-old son who's in the military. Yes. And he purchased a a right a what kind uh right don't even know what that is but that's okay okay and he paid twelve hundred dollars for it <laughs> that's a good camera i guess huh <laughs> not one of those kind of idiot proof cameras what i require okay well hold uh, on i've got uh more yeah where did he buy this overseas uh in the px or anything or just uh, he bought, bought it? it in oklahoma well he was just, uh, okay he bought it that's it okay okay or he's he's paying for it uh over 24 months at $74 a month. Okay. Okay. And so we had the camera appraised today. My wife did. Mm -hmm. And the camera is uh, valued at $250. Lovely. Okay. Why, why did he pay so much? Was it knockoff or was it just that's what the cameras were? I, I think it's... Uh, in other words, if, for example, if he walked in and he thought he was buying a Rolex watch, and we know there's a lot of knockoffs on Rolex, right? Sure. Then he would be, then fraud would have been perpetrated if they thought they said we're selling you a genuine Rolex, and we we sold you, uh, you know, they sold him a knockoff. However, if they sold him a camera, and they said, boy, this is a great camera, it's worth twelve hundred bucks, and he said, yeah, I think it's a great camera, I'll pay twelve hundred. Nothing wrong with that. Well, that's what he did. At any rate. Uh but I guess my question is, uh, is there any way to, to void or cancel this contract? Well, no. Not a, a, again, under the circumstances that you've described to me, kid walked in, he's over 18 years old, that makes him an adult. I know he doesn't look like one. That makes him an adult. And he walked in, and they said, we got this, whatever the camera was, and this is the price, and he was willing to pay that price. Well, where is the harm in that? I mean, I know you don't like it very much, and I can understand that, but what did they do wrong? I understand that too. But if, if, if on the other hand, uh, they said this is uh, whatever that name you mentioned, I don't know the camera, and it really is not, that's a different program. Or if they said this is a, uh, we're back to the Rolex example, this is a, a Rolex solid gold, whatever, and it's really the Submariner, which is the cheapest of their, their line, that would be a different matter too, wouldn't it? Sure. But okay, they have all these documents to this uh, consumer credit agreement. Yeah. And one of the items on here uh, in, in capital letters, okay, do not stop your direct deposit or allotment. Okay, one of the ways, or the way that he's paying for this is that this company uh, has drafted his uh, his paycheck so that the uh, yeah, they have military a here, is automatically paying. Uh, it's it's an allotment, an allotment. An right. allotment, yes. Uh, do not stop your allotment, regardless of who advises you to do so. Remember, it is your credit at risk. Oh, well, that's nonsense. Okay. That's baloney. They just, so they so what's, what's wrong with pack packaging the camera up and sending it because back? Because he signed a contract. That's what's wrong. Okay. I mean, they, 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 you, know, you, you just can't, just because you have buyer's remorse, void a contract. You have to have a reason to void it. Now, if fraud is a, certainly a reason... But the fact that you don't like it, that's no reason. Not a legal reason. Sure, I understand that. Okay. So I, I think we have to look for fraud here, if there is any fraud. Well, let's go back a little bit. You mentioned a brand name, which is meaningless to me, so no point repeating it again. Would that camera, if I went down to... Uh, where are you calling from again? I'm sorry. Durham. All right, well, that's the, 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 the one camera store I can name by a couple in New York City would be Willoughby's 
or a 47th Street photo. These are very famous camera stores, right? Mm -hmm. If I walked into 47th Street photo on West 47th Street, New York City, would I be expected to pay about that price for that camera? Forget about your appraisal. I don't want to hear about that. That doesn't tell me very much. And have you made that inquiry to find out? Well, uh, he, he has taken some photos, and, uh-huh. and the pictures did not take. Well, that doesn't tell me anything either. I've taken pictures with good cameras, and they come out. I, <laughs> you know, as I said, I have to have an idiot-proof camera. Uh, so that doesn't tell us very much, at least from where I'm sitting. Why don't you do this? Why don't you call, call 47th Street Photo in New York City? 40, 47th, 47th Street. Street Photo. This is not a commercial for them, but they're a discount camera outfit. Okay. okay? And tell them you want to buy whatever the name of that brand was, model so-and-so. They'll give you a quote of telephone. Okay. And see what kind of a number they give you. Okay, and, and assume that they say 250 What well, it doesn't make any difference. If that, what I want to know is, is what you have, what you, the contract says, a, a whatever. If that's what you got, they can charge $10,000 for it if you're willing to pay it. Okay. Does that not make sense? So you're, you're, you're telling me that he's stuck. Well, if, if you walk into my store, and I got something on a shelf, and I, and I say that's, I'm trying to think, I, I, because I don't want to get into something that could be, you know, the, where the value would be uh, based upon, uh, its intr- uh, not its intrinsic value, but rather, uh, um, I don't know, let me, uh, say a work of art. That would be a little troublesome, wouldn't it? Yes. Uh, I, I give you an, a certified, a, a diamond, how's that? How's okay. That? I walk in, the diamond's in the, in the case, and I say, that diamond is $1,000. Mm-hmm. Boy, that's a lovely doll. I like that, man. She's going to love that one. And you buy it for 1000 bucks. Hey, we used to have it priced at 1200 Well, maybe they did. Now we're going to sell it for a grand. You take it to another jeweler and say, listen, that piece of stuff, I wouldn't put that on a dog collar. It's only worth 100 bucks. Has fraud been committed? I don't think so. Willing buyer, willing seller. Now, if they said... This, this diamond has been appraised by the Gemological Institute of America, and it's this such a quality and so on and so forth, and it proved to be otherwise, that would be fraud, you see. Right. So I, first of all, find out if they gave him what they said. If they gave him this camera, and it's, if the contract says it's a certain kind of camera, a certain model, and that's what they gave him, the fact that they sell it for more doesn't mean how, you know, you go out and price cars, you find 10 dealers at 10 different prices, right? I understand. So that's what it comes down to. If you can show fraud, then you got something to put a stop on it. Expensive lesson for a young kid to learn. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Net. Ontario, Oregon, it's your turn. Welcome to my world. Hello, Bruce. Hello there. Hey, trying to get a little advice on a... I guess, I'm not sure what you'd call it. I, I, I built a new home about... It'd be two years ago this May. Yeah. And I had some vinyl flooring put in that would have been in May of 93. It was installed, you know, a little prior to that. Uh, pretty good brand name done by a reputable installer here locally mm-hmm. where I live. About three months after we'd moved into the house, we noticed this 10-year wear shine finish they're supposed to have on this new vinyl was wearing out. <laughs> it's in a year and a half, huh? Uh, well, in three months, it was it was showing wear. We got concerned and called the dealer that installed it for us. Uh, he said, yeah, that shouldn't be that way. So he called a factory rep out of a bigger town here close out of Boise yeah. to come look at it. And they, they came in within about 30 days and looked at it and said, yeah, there's something wrong with this finish. It should Son be, of a gun. This thing is pretty clear. Doing that. And at that time, they verbally agreed to replace the flooring. But did they re, uh, re, you mean the material or the or the or the job? Well, they they agreed to replace the material, the vinyl mm. itself. Right. Now I I kind of understood from the the dealer that installed it that you know he'd he'd pay the labor to put it in and the factory would pay for the material to put it back in. That would surprise me. Now, uh, <clears throat> what the problem is we we built the house ourselves. We did hire a lot of the finish work and stuff done, but. We put in all wood base and hand stained and sanded door jams and casings. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
we did a lot of this ourselves, but we did hire part of it. Right. Now, when you take the vinyl out, most of that bass and the door jams that are sitting on top of the vinyl, because they're put in after the vinyl's installed, of course. Mm -hmm. it's got to be removed. Yeah. Now, the, the the installer, local installer, led me to believe that, that he had people that would take it out. And there's an island in our kitchen that needs to be removed. There's a few things that need <laughs> to be removed. The whole island's got to be removed? Yeah. Why is that? Well, it, it wouldn't have to be, but we waited to install it until after the vinyl was put down so they didn't have a big seam to have to glue. So you put it on top? Yes. Mm. Uh, well, they could still, well, no, they couldn't cut around it because it's going to be too high then. Well, what you have to do, you have to have a big long seam they glue because they had to split it and pull it around. It. Well, aside from that, even if you, that, that aside, if it's sitting on top now and you stripped everything else off, well, is that right? No, yeah, I guess it'd be okay. It would match up, it, but, it, but it's but it's a much more complicated job. Clearly, it's all the base ha has to come. Yeah, it'd be easier. It'd be easier to take it away and, and put it back. Well, there there's wiring. There's plug-ins in the island. We installed uh, electrical plug-ins in the island, so it'd be easier for yeah. But there, food but that, preparation. And yeah, stuff. but that's only one little hole. Yeah, it's got electrical stuff. But my concern is, like I said, the the local installer led me to believe he'd he'd fix all this and make it right. Now. Mm -hmm. Oh, probably three months ago, and that's been, you know, close to a year and a half since it was originally installed. Mm. He finally has got around to call me, and he says, if you'll get all the stuff taken out and moved, I'll come put the flooring in. Mm, that, I'm surprised they're even going that far. Uh, you know, I'm... I'm what's just, it, I, you know, I guess, what's it going to cost? Most of this was sweat, from what you're telling me. Yeah, most of it's sweat. Part of the problem, I work for a, work for a company that, that from... Uh, the 1st of August through the end of March, I work 10, 12 hours a day, six days a week. So I don't well, that, that, le that leaves you one day and uh, one full day and so about nine hours the other day is taken off. Uh, you know, the, I, I, I don't know. I guess I feel like the, the local dealer or the factory would want a little bit better public relations you, with people. You, what, what, do you do for, what do you do for a living? What do I do? Yeah. I work for a produce company. Oh, we package are, onions. Are they, is that, that public relations oriented, tell the truth. Most companies aren't. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I think I think that, frankly, you got more than I would have thought you'd get to begin with. Mm. I thought you'd get the material. I'm surprised that's what putting the labor in. Well, I think it doesn't... I'm not necessarily saying you should. I'm surprised you got it. There is a distinction between those two positions. If you listen to this program very regularly, you hear people that aren't getting anything yeah. in these circumstances. I don't think you did badly. Now, the question is, being realistic, how many hours is it going to take you to remove the island, which shouldn't be too hard to do, really, No, and, I, and, I and, don't. and get and get the uh, the molding and that up? What are we talking about in terms of time? Oh, it's, it's probably less than a day of my own time to do it. My well, concern is all the base. I'm talking about getting it all up. How much time? Yeah, pro take? probably in a day I could remove it, but right. I'm probably going to ruin part of the base. Well, probably you probably will. You, you know, I, if I, I hired it done, I could probably get it done for two or three hundred dollars. Well, in that case, are you prepared to spend? Is your time worth two or three hundred bucks? Though that's the answer. Yeah, part of the problem is I don't have the time. You know, I'm willing to. Willing I understand to what you're telling me, but look, you got to look. Sometimes we have to make unhappy choices, don't we? Yeah. Now, what's the best choice? There are three choices. Put the job off until the slow season. I don't think yeah, that's the, a... The installer is willing to do that. Oh, I don't... I, wait. All right, that's one choice. That's a choice. Second choice, take a Sunday and, and give it up and, and do what you got to do to get this done. And recognizing that you're not going to get every piece of molding up in one piece. We all, I don't think any, anybody can... It could be expected to do that. Mm -hmm. And it may well be. It's cheaper to rip it out, the molding. Not mess around with it and just put new molding down. I suspect yeah, that might be the case. It's it's tough when you spent your spare time hand sanding and staining. And Without regard to that. I, look, we're, we're, we're still faced with some tough choices here. Does, uh, and it may be. But I, I'm, I'm still going to go back. to I'm making a statement. It may be easy to rip it out and hand sand again. I don't know that. Mm -hmm. But it may be. Oh, most, most of the corners are glued and nailed. In that so case, you have, you'll have to rip them out. They got to go. Yeah. The third choice: hire somebody for the two or three hundred bucks. Can you? Yeah, you know, I was told here locally that possibly you could go after the installer's 
they have to carry a, a workmanship oh, bond. Cut me a break. For two or three hundred dollars, are you going to do that? Eh. Furthermore, yeah. furthermore, if you go after the guy, right? Yeah. He's probably to say to hell with this. I'm not going to do anything. Come after me for the whole thing. That's what I would do. Oh, I, I, I guess what disappointed me is he made it sound like he was going to do it all and make it right. I mean, we. Well, he's coming pretty close, in my opinion. You know, this was beyond his. Let's, 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 I only got a couple of seconds. Let me ask you this. You're in the onion business, you said, right? Yes. Okay, suppose the bags broke on the onions. You grow the onions, right? Or you handle them. If the bags are had at a bad, we'll say, let's for sake of discussion, somebody dyed the bags, they are colored, and that dye permeated 25 tons of onions. Mm -hmm. Would you say, well, look, we're going to make that good because, after all, we need the public relations? Or we might, you might say, listen, we'll give you a truckload of onions, we get a bag of your own. Oh, we go back to the bad guy. Well, <laughs> if the bad guy had any money. We, we we have problems with bags on a pretty well, regular basis. What I'm trying to get to, do you yeah. see what I'm trying to say? Nobody goes... The hundred. I think that you're being treated. You're being treated a lot better than most of my listeners. Is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay. If if it were me, if I were in your position, I'd. You're telling me you're killing yourself twelve hours a day. You want to have a little family life, right? Yep. Does two hundred bucks going to change your way of life for two and a half hundred dollars? No, no. That's what I would do. I'd spend the money and get on my life. Ah, oh, you get too hum hung up on principle. Well, principle sometimes has to go down the toilet once in a while. Yeah. I mean, for tell you, you reach a point. I was buying something for Christmas. All right. And I was trying to get the thing settled down. And the wind-up was that this changed, this condition changed, and whatever. You know, it was being custom-made. If I said, I said, what the hell am I arguing about? About 50 cents here. This is absurd. Either I'm going to buy it or I'm not going to buy it. And I think you're in the same position. Either you get it done or you don't. If you eat your heart out for a couple, for a couple hundred bucks, I think that that's not necessary. I do wish you well, guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Exeter, Missouri, your turn. Welcome to my world. How you doing, Mr. Williams? I'm doing real well, thank you. Uh, I'm calling to get your opinion on something. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm dealing with a, uh, I guess you would call him a, a uh, broker for well, what, what What's the transaction? Well, the, the transaction was to this broker company for a uh, invention that I've... Uh, Develop. Oh, yeah. You went to one of these companies that tells you that they're going to help you have industry look at your invention and all that sort of stuff, right? Okay. It hasn't got really that far. Only thing I had to do was do a, a patent search for How me. much money did you send them? About 600 bucks? No. How much? Two ninety-eight. dollars All right. Then you got a nice letter back from them saying this is the best thing since ice cream. And send us a lot more money and we're going to help you, right? Well, it wasn't exactly like that. They sent a whole dossier on a lot of stuff that they did mm. and I uh, checked with the uh, Bureau a better been better business Bureau yeah and they don't have any complaints on them mm -hmm. uh, the better where, business, where, where the better business Bureau where in that in that city okay and they uh, okay so I uh, talked to the people there and they gave me a lot of information, and the Better Business Bureau gave me a sheet to to uh, read on what to look out for. Mm -hmm. So I read it and compared it to with the information that they gave me, mm -hmm. and it coincided with the information that the Better Business gave gave to me. I'm not sure what that means. In other words, they was the um, the Inventing Corporation. They told me what to look out for. They did on pressure okay. and all that kind okay. of, all that okay. kind. All right. How'd you happen to hear about this company? I saw it in the back of one of those uh, magazines. What, they, kind, what kind of a magazine? Uh, technical, technical magazine. Okay, go ahead. So I followed up on it after I did uh, some research. Mm -hmm. And some I talked over with some of my friends, so they were... They are concerned about it, right? How much money do they want now? Okay, they have three plans. Mm. Plan one, of them, one, one of them, they pay you, you pay them completely and you own it all. Another plan, you pay them part of it and they own part of it. Another plan, you pay them a little less and they own a bigger part. Right. Boy, am I, what, what am I have? Some, I'm, I'm a psychic, right? No. How much is the uh, most amount of money they want from you? 
10990 Well, that's... But you can handle that. That's a that's jump change. Petty cash, right? Zero percent. Yeah, come on, will you? Look, I don't know. There, there, there may be out there a company that delivers what they say they deliver. I don't know of any company that does, but they may be out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. The attorneys general in the United States, many attorneys general from different states, have published all sorts of stuff about these companies, none of it complimentary. Mm -hmm. None of it. I've never read a complimentary article by any law enforcement official. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident I, if, if somebody wants to push me, I could probably come up with some very uncomplimentary stuff. Mm -hmm. You got an invention, it's going to cost you. You got mm -hmm. to apply for a patent. Uh, if it's patentable, if, it's mechan if, it's, uh, if, it, if it meets the criteria for a patent, you'll have to apply for one. Right. You can spend a year and a half to two years to do that, anywhere from twenty five hundred to five thousand dollars, sometimes more, to get it done. Right. And after that's all done, then you got to figure out a way to merchandise the thing. Right. Those are the facts of life. Yeah. I, I wouldn't send one of these companies ten cents. Uh huh. If it were me, not right. a dime. And that's not me talking. That's well, it's me talking here. Uh huh. But it certainly has been substantiated by by law enforcement officials all over the country. Uh -huh. uh, the the article that I read here some time ago. I said that their success rate was about point zero zero one percent, or ninety nine and a fraction percent. Nothing happens except they got your money. Uh -huh. Does that mean they don't make some motions? Of course not. They may very well, uh -huh. but you're looking for results. Uh -huh. What kind of invention you got? What'd you invent? Uh, a, a type of bandage. Mm. Tough business. Mm. Tough business. How many companies manufacture bandages in this country? Probably half a dozen at the most. Mm -hmm. J and J, Boyer and Black, right? A couple of others. Mm -hmm. Tough racket, kid. I'd be very careful. Where are you? I'm uh -huh. not saying that you haven't got a good idea. Don't misunderstand me. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you're pursuing it the appropriate way. Uh huh. Uh, well, what they told me was that I well before I even got into this part of the deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, quote, several uh, several years ago, I tried to uh, go on my own as far as doing what this company says it can do, mm -hmm. and I, I got as far as the patent office, in, and they want they were charging me a whole lot of money to the, get the patent, a patent. Of, the patent office doesn't charge you a lot of money. A, a lawyer who handles it for you charges you a good deal of money. Yeah, I'm well, that's, sorry. well, that's the way it's. Yeah, that's a any legal matter you got to pay. Right. Well, so they're doing it for less. If I were you, you're asking my opinion, right? Right. That's my opinion. Right. I if you're going to go and have it patented, see a patent attorney, see a patent attorney, and it is going to and, and compare. You may find one guy will do it for less than another, but that's the appropriate way to handle this. The chances of success. They, they aren't too small. They aren't too large. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you happen to hit, you can do very well. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Well, Little Rock, Arkansas. Hello there. How you doing, Bruce? I'm doing real well, thank you. Good. Bruce, um, I have a, a sales route. I'm an independent salesman. What do you sell? Uh, gloves, chemicals, and uh, tools. Gloves? Yeah. Chem that's kind of an odd combination, isn't it? Well, not really, considering who I sell to. Um, who, who, to whom do you sell? Uh, hardware stores, feed stores. Um, I live in southern Arkansas. Well, uh, my route is southern Arkansas, northern Louisiana, and All right. eastern Texas. Okay. So, um, but here's my here's my question is, I'm, I'm curious about incorporating. Um, I'm just starting. Mm -hmm. um, I started November 1st. Um, I don't know whether it'd be better for me to incorporate or to leave it and just pay it, work it like a sole proprietorship. I'd work it for the time being like a proprietorship. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any, any major, you say you're selling chemicals, and theoretically if somebody got hurt, there could be a problem, but I'm balanced. No, uh, the uh, manufacturer's uh, taking care of that. I, I would right. just keep the way it is right now. Well, I, I was talking about basically for tax purposes. Uh, right now, you don't have a tax problem, unless you're making a ton of money. No. In that case, leave it the way it is. Six months from now, things are going real well, we can talk about a corporation, but not now. Okay. I think just work your butt off right now. And don't worry about the taxes. Okay. Uh, are there what What are my what are my best ways to to not necessarily hide money, but what are, what are the things I can do right now? You don't have to hide anything, but you have to keep track of your expenses in what's called a contemporaneous fashion. You keep a little log. You spend two bits for a toll. You put it down. 
Right. A buck and a half to have uh, something, some gum removed from the windshield, write it down. That's all. And those things become deductible against your the money that you receive. About what about what uh, uh, yearly income level would I need to start to look at this? I really can't. I, I can't tell you that. Right now, do me a favor. Yeah. I'll make a deal with you. You call me back in six months. You work your butt off and make some money. We'll talk about it then. Okay. I wish you well, kid. Thanks, Bruce. Detroit, your turn. We have about two minutes to share together. Hey, Detroit, are you there? Well, Danny, hello. My goodness gracious. I don't think we're going to talk to Detroit. Well, that's another program. Maybe not. Anyway, Scott Sloanacre is spinning the appropriate dials. Ted Schneider in master control. Paul Hill is our operations manager. And redoubtable Dan Rudd, who I just found out is going to work at the Cotton, or the work the Cotton Bowl show later in the week. Uh, be, I wonder if I all, the, all these, these football games. My goodness. I, I'll tell you the truth. I'm going to be very relieved when this next weekend is out of the way. I mean, everywhere you look, you pick up the newspaper, everybody's speculating on what's going to... Does any, I, I suppose there are a great many people out there that really care. But I, Mr. Pete, I, I start to wonder about this whole whole uh, sports mania that, that we are we're having in this country, that we're having a stroke because guys were overpaid tremendously well maybe that's not a fair statement they're paid a great deal of money to run around in short pants in the summertime and a very hazardous job and be paid millions of dollars a year for it and then we have some other guys who run around in the damnedest funniest outfit in the world i mean for goodness sakes if you if you stand alone outfit of a hockey a uniform is probably the funniest thing anybody ever laid eyes on and they're all worried about free agency and uh, the zillion dollars you're not going to make this year and the most laughable thing of all we have a bunch of franchise owners who are wandering around the country trying to persuade you and me, trying to persuade us that they really have the fans, not me because I'm not a fan, but they have the fans' best interest at heart. If you believe in that, I would love to discuss ownership in a bridge either in San Francisco, New York City, or any place you'd like to own one. The owners of these sports franchises care for one thing, themselves. The idea of the municipalities bidding for franchises and saying, we'll take taxpayers' money, which could be spent for police and fire and school and education and prime and building huge stadiums so these guys can run around in short pants. Hey, wouldn't this be time to make sports franchises, freestanding businesses, no tax breaks, no legal breaks, compete with the rest of us? And if you want a stadium, go build one and pay the players a little less and the owners take a little less. Anyhow... Try and do what's right, kids. We'll see you tomorrow. I thank you so very much. It's not easy, but give it your best shot. I'm Bruce Williams. Keep in touch. You know they're going to get you. Oh, one way or another. Absolutely. So you're better off to remove yourself before you give them the chance to set you up. Now, people are going to say, oh, no, this isn't right, and that's not fair. That's all very true. It's not it's fair, not but right, it's right. And it's not fair. Exactly so. I think that there's your wife can, can, can fight it, and maybe she'll win. They'll get it the next time. Well... Human resources, basically, she did appeal through human resources, and their response was, you were the manager, acting manager, and what you did basically was you paid the locksmith for two keys, and if there was only one, you're still in violation of Wallen's policy. You paid for something that we oh, did not receive. That's absurd. I agree, but, that's you know, absurd. I thought, well, you have good advice. I'd call you and see, hey, is there well, anything we can do? I'd go look for another job for Well, me. she is. Okay, I, I I don't mean to be unfeeling, but you know what you know where I'm oh. coming from exactly where I'm coming from. I know I just the realities are a lot of people don't want to face these realities. You know, it's a, everybody says, but well, we want to be socially responsible, but yet when we were little kids, we were um, well, most of us, oh, don't never be a snitch, and we still carry this through into our lives that it's well, terrible to be a snitch. The one thing is, is that you know the manager had told my wife within the first week that if an employee is terminated or leaves without notice, nothing they say has any weight or credibility with the company. Say that again? If an employee qu quits or is terminated for cause, yeah. nothing they say has any credibility or weight with the company after that. I'm not, sure what, I'm I, not even sure what you just said to me. I'm, I apologize. Well, it just means basically if an employee quit or quits without notice or is fired, 
they can't. The home office won't listen to anything they have to say afterwards, oh. or believe it. Well, that's not very smart part of the home office, is it? No. What can you say? Not much. What okay. Can say that he's, he, ain't, he ain't always right, but he's always the boss. He's always the boss. You got it. Thank you, sir. Good luck, guy. Okay, bye. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in. This is TalkNet. All righty. We go now to Columbia, South Carolina. Hello there. Hey, Bruce. It's a privilege to talk to you. Well, thank you, my friend. What's on your mind? Well, I have a friend that uh, is told me the other day that he uh, was going to invest $14,900 in a wireless cable system. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, well, where did you hear about this? And he said, well, I heard about it on TV. And <laughs> uh, so I, I asked him the, the, uh, the question, well, if they have to advertise for an investment, how can it be that good? <laughs> yeah, and, you, and what did he say to that? Well, he said that, uh, well, they got to have a lot of investors, so in order to find the investors, they have to advertise for them. Yeah, baloney. Well, you know, I'm, I'm like, well, if, if they're, well. If know. it's such a good deal, you asked the right question. Why do they have to run ads in, 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 on television and radio for investors? Well, it's... That, 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 that's the, you, you asked the right question and get a good answer or save your money. Yeah, well, the people with money... Uh, you know, they don't usually go to TV to find their investment opportunity. Well, you know, I don't have any, no, wait, let's, let's clarify that. I don't have any objection to uh, Prudential Bates or, or some of that nature, that stature, A.G. Edwards or somebody running ads. You know, we do a good job and so forth. I don't think you would either. Right, no, of course but, not. But, but specific ads of that kind, I am highly suspect of. I'm not going to tell you they're all unworthy because I don't know that to be the case but I would certainly be suspect and I'm very suspect of advertising that promise, promises me unusual returns well this one uh, the the schedule of returns shows in the first two years where the you, you almost you lose a little bit of money but then after the first two years if they get the scheduled um, if, if they get the franchise well, it, it didn't. It, the way he put it was, if they get the customers they expect to get. Yeah. I didn't hear anything about franchise. Oh, I th oh, they they already have the license. Is that what they're telling you? That well, I think so. That's that's the way I understand All it. Right, so if they get the customers, then you're gonna make a ton of money, huh? Right. After five years, you you go from fifteen thousand to one hundred and five thousand or something like that. Now, ask yourself, is that reasonable? Well. It may not be reasonable, but it sounds That's good. That's a terrible idea. That's seven, a, a, a seven, uh, well, a six times, uh, in six fold increase mm -hmm. in five years. Does that sound reasonable to you? No, it's not of very. Not. Of course, not reasonable. No. And if that kind of return was was probable, mm -hmm. do you think for a moment you couldn't go to one of the huge? Uh, suppliers of money and they jump in with both feet and kiss you on the lips? <laughs> well, I suppose they would. <laughs> if in five years, mm -hmm. if in six years your money doubled, mm -hmm. right? That's 12% a year compounded Well, but before no. taxes. 12% is not a bad return. No, it's... And it would take six years for your money to double. Uh, five years would be, let me see, uh, 50, 10, 14, and uh, two-fifths percent. Mm -hmm. 14 and two-fifths percent compounded mm. before before taking taxes into account. Yeah. yeah that's, that's if it doubles in five years. Well, I think the idea here was that there's more risk involved. Yeah, no, is what? Boy, am I so? There's actually <laughs> risk involved here. No. Well, just a little bit, yeah. but risk is commensurate with gain. That's true, and you can do better on a craps table. Oh, you can't. Well, let well, let me ask you this then: How? I mean, surely they. I mean, apparently they set up a lot of these systems over the country. I saw the brochures and the mm -hmm. folders. I mean, it's a slick piece. Well, I'm sure. Would you expect otherwise? Looking for fifteen grand a pop? Well, no, I wouldn't. Okay. Um, and I, I told, uh, I told my friend, I'm like, you know, that he said, well, if I lose it, I lose it. I'm like, going, well, yeah, but you, did, you weren't thinking about it that way when you were making it because it didn't come that easy. Well, can he afford to lose fifteen grand? 
Well, he could. I mean, yeah. if it's highly, if it's speculative, and he's, he's checked it out to a point, I have no problem with that. As long as he realizes that there's uh, an extremely high possibility of losing his money. Well, he was reading through the material, and he said that it looked in there like he could actually, they could actually come back and require more money from him if well, things didn't go the way they expected. In other words, what, what is it, a partnership of some exactly. kind? Exactly. But it's, but it's not limited to your initial investment. Uh, apparently not. It's ex they're accessible in some way. Mm -hmm. Boy, not me. Not me, kid. Maybe I'm passing up the chance of a lifetime. <laughs> I'm liable to sit here two years from now and say, wow, that guy from Chattanooga called me, or Columbia, I'm sorry, and man, did I screw up. I don't think so. <laughs> but well, then, you know, you know, uh, if, I, if you'd have bought coffee futures here a couple, three weeks ago, you'd done real well. well but but who the hell could have predicted a double frost? It's too late to buy coffee futures now, huh? No. But to, <laughs> to make the kind of return. <laughs> well, of course. I mean, it, the reason that the coffee futures went up like crazy is because of a, of a huge frost. Yeah. Well, you can't. That's like buying hurricane insurance after the storm. No. Hmm. <laughs> no, it's too late now. <laughs> you got to get. If you can, you know, you can uh, buy. Well, here's a perfect example. If you bought orange juice futures and all of a sudden half the world is wiped out of orange juice, then you've done real well. Yeah, yeah but how often does that happen? Well,. Very rarely. You got that part right. You got that part right. So I guess it's the uh, the steady and uh, slow way. I have no problem with speculation. I'm a gambler. Mm -hmm. But I want people, if they want my money to gamble, I want you to tell me what the odds are. I don't want you to paint it with pretty brochures and tell me about these incredible returns unless you tell me the odds are, are 30 to 1 or 25 to 1 or something of that nature that you're going to lose everything you got. And then furthermore, there's a possibility of losing even more. And I want that spelled out in big print. And I'll bet you, maybe I'm mistaken. You tell me. I don't want to I don't want to give anybody a bad rap. But I bet you had to look pretty hard to find out that this, that there was a possibility of further assessment. Well, he did. But, but, I, he found it, but there was in, in big, bold print where you couldn't miss it? Well, I didn't see it, but I saw the papers. You have to sign a litany of papers. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I... I agree to this, and I agree to that. He started reading it. Oh, my what a what a show! Who started reading it? <laughs> Terrible! What a mistake that was! Oh, he's ready to do it. And, well, and, uh, hey, I said, he, wait a minute, I gotta call Bruce. If he's ready to do it, I'm not going to dissuade him. If he's read everything and he's a big boy and he can take the hit. Well, he's he's a little hesitant now that he's read the material. Oh my goodness! Anymore. What a shock! Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> let, is there any way he can find that? There's one. Uh, uh, set up here in this state uh, the, from the same company. Is there any way that he can find out how that? What, did, what would the, what would that have to do with anything? I don't know. Nothing. I, well, it would say that they've done it before. Well, it I, I also I uh, make the point that the, that uh, Mrs. Clinton hit the uh, futures jackpot. Yeah. Well, she was just a very lucky lady. Well, <laughs> maybe she was lucky, <laughs> and maybe she had an assist. But the point is. For every person that makes money, what is it, seventy odd percent of the people that involve themselves in futures get their head handed to them. Yeah, it's a zero sum game. Yeah, well the point is that uh unless your name is Mrs. Clinton and you're married to a governor at the time, it's probably not a good place for the amateur to be. Yeah. yeah. Which is uh, and my apologies to Mrs. Clinton if she's in innocent, but I don't think that she is in this regard. Yeah. Well, but I would... be that as it be that as it may. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, the smart money says these things are things to be avoided. If it was so, if it was so easy, here let's go back right to square one. Mm -hmm. If it was so easy, there'd be absolutely no necessity to spend a lot of money to run ads to go to amateurs on television. Well, that's true. Well, I thought that's that, it. That's I thought it. That, well, now, I thought the uh, you know they they sold the frequencies. Just a few weeks ago, they yeah. were selling more frequency. Yeah, and then there's some, some minority and women's interest to be considered and all that good stuff, yeah. Yeah, but it, does that have anything to do with something like this? I'm not sure. Oh. I would be it would be, I would be disingenuous if I told you I knew. Okay, well, so, uh, that... Any time somebody tells me they're going to uh, give me six times my money back in, in, in five years, man, I get nervous as hell. Unless they're telling me, put it in a crap stable with a roll four times. That's another story. If you, can afford, if you can afford to lose. Hey, we're going to be here at 10 o'clock tonight for pre-tape. I hope you'll join us. I'm Bruce for TalkNet. Houston, welcome to my world. Bruce, this is Bill. How you doing there? 
I am doing real well, Bill. Well, good. Sir, my question is, I'm trying to find out what rights my deceased grandmother, as well as her family, may have. The uh, situation is that um, in 88, my grandmother passed away. And she had a husband or has a husband, and at that time... You say has or had? Well, has a husband. My grandfather's still alive. Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, when my grandmother passed away, he went and he purchased a double-wide plot uh, for her as well as him when he d passes on. Is right. And the stone is a double-wide stone. It has my grandmother's birth and death date as well as his name. His birth date. Exactly. Just w waiting just for... <laughs> <laughs> he and, for the, uh, other, the other, other statistic. Isn't that nice? Exactly. Um, my grandfather is being moved into an um, old people's home um, real soon, and my family went to see him this weekend, and unbeknownst to us, we found out that approximately three years ago, he'd gone to a lawyer and had drawn up uh, a legal document stating that he wanted to be buried elsewhere. Uh, basically, he wanted to be buried where uh, his um, more of his roots were in, 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 during his younger years. Needless to say... Well, let's stop right there. He went to an attorney right? when he was in perfect, sound mind and whatever. That's correct, yes, sir. Right, that's certainly his right. Even though, you know, what rights does my grandmother have? I mean... He, None. Well, what do we do with a double plot and you know that he's probably gonna it's probably gonna sit there is that right yeah up where my mother and dad are, are are buried there are two or three graves in my family there is one where my cousin is buried right and right next to him there is his wife's uh name and her date of birth right mm -hmm. well she remarried now it's very unlikely that she's going to be buried there would you agree it's going to remain empty forever. Adjacent to that is his mother's, um, you know, a stone for his mother. Mm -hmm. But she died, and this is in the East Coast, and she died in California. Her daughter had her buried there. That one's going to stay empty, too, forever, I would think. You know, in order, how would you... you know, I'd like to kind of complete the stone. Say when my grandfather does pass on, is there any? Would there be anything wrong in, in going ahead and finishing the stone out, even though he, he may not be buried there? And there's Absolutely not. not. No, there's no reason in the world why you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't know, you know, because it's somewhat upset. It's very upsetting, I should say, to, my, to the family. And I'm sure, had my grandmother still be here, she would be totally devastated. Um, no, hold know. on. Why? 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 Well, I mean, they're, they, were, they were happily living together whenever she passed on. I mean, what has changed his mind since? And I, we have no idea. Well, what difference does it well, make? When well, you're you, right. Well, I mean, they're, they're there, gone. There's nothing that when, when they're, your grandmother's spirit or whatever, if there is such a thing, and I believe there to be, has nothing whatever to do with, with, with that. those so many chemicals that are stuck in a, in a hole in the ground. Right. And if he, if he is more comfortable, for whatever reasons... What possible? Because it's the knowledge, not the fact that he'll be put in the ground and wherever it happens to be. When my mother was in her 90s, she was living not too far from where I am now. But my dad was buried in New Jersey. And she all she kept saying to me was, promise me you won't leave me here. I want to be in such a place. I said, Mom, not to worry. I'll take care of it. And I did. I had flown up there and so on and so forth. But it was the it, it really did me a damn thing after she passed away, in my opinion, except that my to honor my, ob my obligation to her. But I don't think it made the slightest bit of difference to her. Mm -hmm. But in, when, while she was alive, she wanted to be buried near my dad and wanted to know that would happen. I assured, I assured her that it would, and it did. Okay. I think you have to respect the right of a person when they're alive. Mm -hmm. I don't, a funeral is not for the dead. Funerals for the living. Well, I agree with you. And like I said, the, the, the uh, certain side of the family is, like I said, they, they, they wish him to come back and, and be placed next to my grandmother. And that's what Don't I you think that's pretty selfish? Well... When you think about it. Yes and no. I mean, no, I just, what's the no side? Give me, I, I can understand the yes, it's selfish. Give me a, why is it, un, why is there any justification that whatever? Well, like I said, it's, 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 it's not for the dead, so it excludes my grandmother's wishes. Um, 
it's you know the the, the burial the, whatever is for the living. But don't you think the person who dies has a right to choose? Well, I, I agree. And he chose let's assume one. let's assume that in 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 a, in a particular religion. There is a prohibition on a certain type of, of, of treatment for the sake of discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, if the person who passes away says, this is what I want done with my remains, who's re who should be respected? That person's wishes or the wishes of the family? Oh, I, I, yeah, it's clear. Right. My opinion. Well. In this I, case, is perfectly clear from where I'm sitting. I don't Okay, but then you're suggesting or I guess that in order to just go ahead and fill the stone out accordingly. Oh, that, that is, if you want to do that, there's absolutely no prohibition against that. But, well, there's not much more you can do with a double wide stone. Well, I mean, you have, I, you could, if you could have it replaced and have somebody else buried there, you right. still have the you still have the uh, the uh, title to the to the lot, right? And it, I'm sure that will pass directly or indirectly to one of his heirs. Oh. And if somebody else wants to use it, there's no reason why it can't. You could buy a new stone for your grandmother mm -hmm. and have it moved over a little bit mm -hmm. and utilize the lot if that's what you want to do. I, just, I can't see any prohibition on that unless he specific. I was the, I am the uh, personal administrator, a personal representative in, a, in, a, in an estate, right? Mm -hmm. And there were 12 graves in the cemetery. And the lady who passed away left a, a very substantial amount of money to a charity. A condition of the the will was that they accept title to these graves, mm -hmm. and the further condition is that they will never be traded, bartered, or in any way occupied. They will remain empty in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. That's what she wanted. Mm -hmm. The reasons are not. I'm not going to share with you here, mm -hmm. but the fact is that's what she wanted, and if the charity wanted the money, and they certainly did, mm -hmm. it was a, certainly a very good charity. They accepted the title to those graves. And they have to keep them empty forever. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the perpetual care has already been paid, so that's not a problem. All righty, well. In this case, you can, I'm sure your family could use the, the grave if they choose to. Right. He Supposedly that's already been uh, um, willed to, to, to my mother, I believe. But, okay. Um, but, like I said, you go through thinking that um, you know, your grandparents would be buried side by side or your parents or whatever and you come maybe but maybe somebody doesn't want it though right, he didn't, I understand. maybe he maybe he didn't like your grandmother <laughs> who the hell knows they may have had a very tough marriage and i'm not spending eternity lying next to her right that's his business yeah i understand i wish you well, all right well, thank you for your time that's all right kid i'm bruce williams hanging for more this is talk that jackson <clears throat> mississippi hello there hi hi oh uh, i'm having a problem i just bought a house about 10 months ago uh -huh. And I didn't know this until recently, but the uh, people behind me had filled in a drainage ditch. My uh, my yard slopes down towards the back fence. So this lady that lives directly behind me filled in the drainage ditch that was supposed to run off mine and my neighbor's property. Where On whose property was the drainage ditch? It was in between mine and hers. It was on right both? on the property line. Okay. Uh, but she did this before you bought the place, right? Right. All right. Uh, now she has built a six to eight inch dam of leaves, branches, uh, just all cans, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, right in the back of her property, which is in between the cyclone fence between my. What, what is the purpose of this dam? So my water wouldn't run off in her yard now. So it's my yard slopes down towards the back. Well, where did this ditch go to? It's filled in. It went. No, I know oh, it's okay, filled okay. in. Okay, I got you. It it uh, went down her property line into the gutter. Well, in why don't you just open property. the ditch up again? It's on her property. You said she that. Won't do it. Well, no, wait a minute. You told me it was on the property line. Right. Well, then open it up on your side of the line. Well, there's nowhere for the water to run, even if I did, because on her part, the the ditch ran between her house. I'm aware of and that. Another house. But where, where does the edge of your property wind up? And it's a corner of four people's backyards. And then it then and then and then it ran additionally at 90 degrees to her property. Is that it? It ran parallel to her house down to the other street. But it made a, it made a turn someplace then, apparently. No. 
It, it, it did. Yeah. Maybe I'm missing something. Okay. If the, it's a, at the back of your property, right? Mm -hmm. There was a ditch. Right. Now, it ran. It, that just, it ran parallel with your back line. Right. All right. No, now, no, no. It ran parallel to my side line. Well, and that's her back line. And that's her back line. All right. So it runs parallel to your side. Mm -hmm. And it runs all the way down to the back of your property, right. to the to the back corner of her property. And it continues on to the front of her property. It, it makes a turn then, doesn't it? Or well, does it? I guess, yeah, kind of. You could say that. It, yeah. When when the when the when the property plats were approved, mm -hmm. how old is this development? Uh, I was 25, 27 years old. When the plats were approved, have you gone back and looked at them and to see what the drainage was? Because the plats would require a drainage plan. I didn't know that. Well, I would hope that it did if they have a responsible building department. Well, this well, is Mississippi. Pardon me? <laughs> I said, well, this is Mississippi. Well, nothing wrong with Mississippi. <laughs> I would go back to the, first of all, take a look at the original building plats mm -hmm. and see if those ditches show. If they do, she had no right to put them in there, and you may be able to go to the appropriate authorities and make her open it up again. Where would I find these at? They'd be on file in your community at your planning board. Oh, okay. Or with your town clerk, I'm not sure, but probably with the planning board, the clerk of the planning board. What if they don't show a drainage? Well, if they don't, you got a problem. Put a dry yeah. well in, I guess. Huh? Well, that, how much how much of a runoff problem do you have? Oh, man, it's awful. It's... Uh, at least six inches deep at times during hard rains, and about 10 feet in di uh, diameter. How long does it take to go away? Well, it, it never does go away because it rains so much that it, it by the time it gets to the ground, the ground stays wet. Hmm. Uh, it never gets dry. There's no other way to get rid of it, huh? None. Well, well, I mean, there is. That's not true. There is a way to get rid of it. A couple of ways I can think of. Let's assume that we can't solve it any other way, right? <clears throat> you have a, uh, in the front of your house, the front, mm -hmm. is there a storm drain or something out there? There's a, uh, yeah, but that's about, that's higher. Much I didn't higher. ask, I didn't ask, did I ask you about the height? <laughs> what did I say? Is there a, is there a yes. storm drain out in front of the house? Yes, there is. How far is that from this wet spot? Mm, about 165 feet. No, that's not far. If no, if everything else fails, right? Mm -hmm. What you can do is you dig a hole in the middle of this wet spot, mm -hmm. about six feet deep, mm -hmm. five and a half. You know, are you familiar with the cinder blocks that you can buy that are curved, mm -hmm. so they they form a circle? Right. Okay. You can build what you term the drywall, which is effectively what it would be. Maybe you want to put a little gravel on the bottom of this thing. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Then you get a ditch, which you know what that is. Mm -hmm. You dig a ditch about eighteen inches deep, all the way out to the front of your house. Mm -hmm. And you put an inch and a half plastic pipe in there, mm -hmm. and a submersible pump in that hole back there, mm -hmm. with a grating on top. End of story. Mm -hmm. I used to dry up a, a field with about six acres on it like that. I'd have to pump it as far as you have to pump it, but I had a hell of a lot more water to deal with. I, mean, I had, you know, a pond sometimes a half acre in diameter, mm -hmm. drained right into my little hole. Pump picked it up and took it away. So would I I'd use a what type of pump? A gas? No, no. What the hell is that? Well, I'm sorry. What's that? A sub. I've sir? never, never, never done anything like that. Before. You buy a submersible sub pump uh -huh. that works on water pressure. You have to run a line in there. You know, electric line back there, mm -hmm. and you also have to run a, a breather line from the pump up above the ground, so okay. that the switch will work. But that's no big deal. Okay. Probably do the whole thing exclusive of the digging the, of the hole. 300 bucks, 400 bucks. Hmm. I guarantee it'll work. Because I've done it. Okay, and if there is, then I go to the planning authority and say... That's the first thing. Find out if there's a ditch required there. Okay. I do wish you well, guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Nick. Hey, Boise, how are you? Fine, how are you, Bruce? Good. You're the gentleman who called who had a, an offer for a great travel deal, right? Yeah. Talk to me. You were going to play Hawkshaw the detective here and go out and get all the poop. So right. tell us what the offer was and tell us what you did. Okay. The offer entailed six days, five nights, 
Uh, two of those nights would be in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, the other two would be in the Grand Bahamas. Mm -hmm. um, that's four. What happened to the fifth? Uh, I would assume that's maybe the time spent back and forth on the ship. Okay. Um, that's a good question, though. Um, I did call uh, the holiday and talked with the gal there extensively about um, had she seen this and, and what the legitimacy was of it and how valid it was. And sure enough, she's um, she confirmed pretty much and answered my question satisfactorily, including one about whether or not I would have to pay for the rooms uh, that I stayed, you know, when I stayed there. And sure enough, that's covered as well. Mm -hmm. um, I called... Call the cruise company? I, I've been trying to. Um, I missed them by like 10 minutes each time <laughs> I've tried to call them because of my work schedule. Mm -hmm. um, however, I did reach somebody at the, the cruise company, and they said that they have been doing business with this travel agency for the last seven years. So, uh, And he confirmed a lot of the questions I asked him about. Uh, the times and how the the promotion of it, just the you know the the atmosphere, of the promotion of it, and how good it seemed. So, mm -hmm. and I also called uh, the travel agent itself and and talked at length with a fellow who was real patient with me and <laughs> my questions anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was much more helpful than the gal that I had talked to last time. And uh, I found out a lot more from him, mm -hmm. which put me at ease actually. What did you find out? Well, for one, uh, I have a year instead of just this September. I have September 95. Um, the location is Freeport in the Bahamas. Did they give you the name of the hotel there? They gave me two names, and uh, I chose not to write them down, um, later regretting that, I suppose. Um, he said either of those two would be paid for by this uh, vacation company mm -hmm. um i simply had to call 45 days prior let them know what my wants and needs were mm -hmm. and they would send you know the appropriate uh things out reservations however the only the glitch that i guess i'm uncomfortable with is the fact that it's a one call deal when you call they take the numbers from you and if you don't want it then they say well well we can hold this for a little while but after that we the computer will just kick you out mm -hmm. essentially so that would probably be my only concern is uh, trying to gather all this information to make a you know a six day cruise come together inside of well it's not a six day cruise right it's a two it's a one day cruise <laughs> it, well it's two days in the Bahamas two days in Florida uh huh and it's a ferry boat ride over and back right I mean, right. it's it's sort of a cruise ship but it's a ferry boat ride actually it, it does say six days and five nights so perhaps I well, where are the two days. What's that? Where are the other two days? Well, they're two.